Uh, welcome everyone to tonight's episode of Profound States. Tonight we have a special guest, Ronnie Dawson. He's an alien uh, contactee and UFO experiencer. Uh, he, his encounters are in the Texas oil field, which I have worked in personally. <laughs> uh, he's had several UFO encounter, uh, craft encounters, uh, something about a cattle abduction. That, uh, we'll have to get into that one. Alien home invasion survivor, uh, mile-long UFO flyover, alien first contact, a, uh, alien sexual encounter. Uh, we've heard a few, a couple of those, or I've heard of one at least. There's one guy that gets into that. Uh, an alien galaxy observation. I think I know what that one is. And then uh, a con consciousness transference to a clone on an alien planet. That's got to be an interesting story. He's also the author of uh, Ronnie Dawson UFO Story, which is available on Barnes and Noble. Uh, welcome to Not Show, Ronnie. Thank you, Charles. It's nice to be here. It's always uh, a pleasure. Where, you live in Texas. Where You still live in Texas? Yeah, I, I live in a little town called Ranger, Texas, which is about halfway between Abilene, Texas, and Fort Worth, Texas, right on I-20. So it's right between here in the northern hill country. Between Abilene and Fort Worth. And Fort Worth. So is it is it wet? Is it uh, west of Dallas? West of Fort uh, Worth? Yes, yeah, west of Fort Worth. Yeah, it's about I'm probably about eighty miles from Fort Worth, right on the interstate. So are you northwest of Fort Worth? Yeah, just almost due straight, 80 miles due west of Fort Worth. Oh, so it's, you're equal with Fort Worth. Yeah, okay. and Abilene is about 60 miles from me, the other direction out west. So, oh, Okay, so you're halfway between Abilene and Fort Worth. So I've lived in Dallas and also uh, the mid-cities between Dallas, you know, Arlington. I've never lived in Fort Worth. I've been there and seen the buffalo there and that sort of thing. But, uh, so why don't we uh, go ahead and get started and uh, on your stuff. Go to, uh, what's the earliest, how old were you when you first got in, uh, had anything strange happen to you? What age were you? Well, I mean, uh I mean, the earliest thing that I ever saw, I said, we used to trap. We live in the hill country up here, and we have a lot of trapping and, and hunting and fishing and uh, and stuff like that. So we were actually running some traps, and uh, I had a Bigfoot encounter. Like they, I think I was a sophomore in high school. I actually had a Bigfoot encounter, and uh, that. Well, tell tell I us. I mean, that. go ahead. I like I like to, you know, yeah. I, I haven't had any. Uh, I have uh, one I went, two people that I'm going to bring on the show that are. That are yeah. totally focused on big on uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot, and but I haven't had them on the show yet. So you're the first one. So go ahead and yeah, tell that I mean story. that was a that was a, I mean uh, I was I was going into the forest up here. We had like 22 traps set. I was actually running the traps before I went to high school in the mornings. So I would get up at like 4:30 a.m. to get off out into the woods where the traps is at. And uh, basically, I would uh, I would shoot the animals, and um, I had another guy who would bait them out in the afternoons and stuff. So we were like partners on this thing. And uh, but I was going off into the woods in the dark at four thirty in the morning, and I wasn't scared of anything out there. I knew the most dangerous thing out there in the dark was me with a gun. I had had absolutely, and there was big st stories in our area. And a, a guy where we were trapping had had seen one. Uh, uh, maybe a decade before, you know, we just kind of, we talked about the story and laughed, but it scared the guy so bad. And what, what happened was the guy was deer hunting one morning and, and uh, he heard something behind him and he spun around and it was getting really late. He's, and he spun around and, there, and this thing was reaching for him and it was about five feet away and it just scared the heck out of him. And he pulled the trigger on the gun and actually shot it and, and it, and it ran off into the woods and and he and he told his dad uh, that owned the property what had happened and his and his dad thought well he just he probably shot a how a cow or a horse god only knows something scared him and he sh he shot it and he found the blood trail and they said he went off into the creek bed and then crossing the sandy creek bed down there he said it was this, the old man described it and this was an old rancher 
and this guy's man, he had to be 70, 80 years old. And he said, he said, it, he said, all I know is he, he, he shot it and it was, I followed the blood trail to a Sandy Creek crossing where I could see some really good prints. And he said it was the strangest tracks I've ever seen. And he, 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 he watched the buzzards. The buzzards tell you when something's dead out there. He said, never saw the buzzards uh, circle where anything had died. And, and, uh, and he, he said, the old man, he didn't say, describe the footprints, but he said it was the strangest tracks he'd ever seen when he tracked the bloodstream to the Sandy uh, Creek crossing where he could actually see some prints. And uh, so we laughed about the story, but I never, we, I had no concern over running into a Bigfoot out there. And uh, the thing was that something had been, we weren't really catching a lot of animals. And there was animals' legs in the traps and something had pulled the carcass out of the, like it had ripped the leg off the animal. I know, and if you leave animals in the traps too long, they will chew their own legs off to get away. And uh, but these these legs and the stuff that we were finding in our traps had were like they they had been pulled, like the the carcass that had been grabbed by something big and just pulled out. You know, like it ripped the leg plum off of them, and uh, we had no idea, yeah, what had done that. And we we found a few uh, carcasses, you know, uh, with that without the just the legs in the traps you know and uh we didn't know what was doing it but we know we and i found sticks where something had set the traps off like a person or something and had gotten all the bait out of it and uh we were just we were confused why we weren't catching more and uh and one afternoon we were actually there together on a weekend and we were moving some traps and stuff and we went out there and there was a frog pond up in the hill and you really couldn't access it by pickup so you had to walk to it so we uh we walked up there and it was probably we had to park to pick up and probably walk uh but probably a half mile of this two tracker road that had been washed out it was like a jeep road but it had been washed out to where you couldn't get a vehicle up it anymore and uh, we knew there was a lot of frogs up there because we had seen them before so we decided to take our we had 22 two of us there we had 22s with us we went up there to to see if we could shoot some bullfrogs so we we hiked up this thing and when we got up there, uh, there were lots of little frogs, but no big frogs. And then all of a sudden, we I heard something roar, and it, it sounded like a gorilla. I mean, I mean, uh, you're not going to forget <laughs> something that roars at you like a gorilla up there. And it was in the trees, and we couldn't see what it was. And then you could, it was so big, you could see it moving through the trees towards us. And, uh, and we started backing up and backing up and uh, I dropped to one knee and I told my buddy, he said, man, line up on it, you know, whatever it is, we're going to empty, empty on it, you know, and it was coming towards the water, coming towards us. And, uh, and this thing it, I seen, and it was breaking tree limbs along the way and, and it snapped one big tree limb off. And, uh, I thought, man, whatever this thing is, it's huge. It roared. And it, like a gorilla and it's coming through the, it's man. It seemed like uh, mighty Joe young or something like that. I mean, that's, it was something big and uh, it was coming at us and it, it got to the last tree before it came out into the open and I was getting ready to fire on it, but I didn't want to shoot a cow or a bull or something like that. I wanted to make sure I could identify it first. And I could, and I could see this thing and this, this thing, it had shoulders like a football player and it had, had, had a light fur on them and I could not see the head, but it was peeping its head around the one side of the tree. And this thing, it showed us for eight feet tall. So it probably had to be, I'd say, man, close to nine, 10 feet tall. And it's, and it showed us look like it was four feet wide and covered with hair. And it had big biceps on it and two arms on it, like a football, like a giant football player. And, uh, I was like, what in the world are we looking at here, man? If it, you know, if it stepped out in the open, we probably would have emptied our guns on it. But I, I couldn't quite figure out what it was, but it kept peering its head from one side of the tree. And then you could see what one eye, then they'd do it on again on the other side. And, and it never got out into the open. And, and then my, my buddy said, the hell with it, I'm out of here. So he, he took off, man. I'm going, no, man, wait, no. And uh, so, so he left me there. It was me and it now. And that, 22 I was holding uh, seemed pretty like a pretty small gun to be shooting at something this size and and I was going oh man you know I'm afraid this thing is going to charge and it's definitely looking at us and uh so I started backing out too and I started backing out and uh, like I said I'm backing out slowly I'm keeping my gun pointed at this thing and I'm and I'm walking out of this thing backwards and all of a sudden I hear the trees rustle to my left and I'm thinking something is fixing, fixing to flank me 
And so I spun around over there, but the noise came from the trees. I didn't see anything. And then I looked back to where the original siding was and I kept backing up and backing up. And I backed up a few more feet and I heard the bushes again off to my off to my left. Like something's trying to flank me again. I spun around over there again. And this time I seen a huge rock come rolling out of trees. So whatever this thing was, it had grabbed some big old rocks. I mean, rocks that a person couldn't throw and had thrown them. And these rocks, I seen this rock roll out of the trees. And I realized it was, it was, it was a rock. It wasn't this thing. It was throwing rocks at us. And uh, so after I seen that it was a rock, I backed up. I was far enough away now. I just turned and started running, and I was hoping my friend had wasn't scared enough that when he made it to the pickup, I was hoping that pickup would still be there, because <laughs> uh, I was afraid he might have been scared enough he might have left the property and left me abandoned down here with this thing. So when I seen that old blue, I think it was a fifty, it was a fifty-seven Chevy pickup. When I seen that old blue pickup, man, I was sure happy to see that thing. <laughs> he had it cranked up, and, and he was ready to go. And I, we, I threw my gun in that thing. And we took off out of there, and uh, I ain't talking about going down there running their traps. Really got really scary then after I'd seen that thing. And I got to the point I wouldn't go down there until it had gotten daylight anyway. And I and I, I started carrying a bigger gun. I started carrying a thirty out six with me instead of that twenty two. <laughs> and because uh, man, I didn't want to run out of this thing down there and not have a not have. It would take a big weapon to take that thing down, whatever it was. And uh, you know it. Did that you was, run into it again after that? No, I, I never saw it again. And we went back to, I, I kept begging my buddy, we got to go back and uh, and investigate, you know? And he didn't want to, he didn't want no party. He didn't want to go down there. He didn't, and I, I said, come on, man, let's go. I said, just get it. Let's take our deer rifles with us and we'll go down there. If we run on this thing, you know, we may have to shoot it, you know? So we went down there and um, like I said, it was dry enough that you could, really couldn't get some, any good kind of good footprints around there. The, the, the ground was just baked clay, it seemed not very conducive of a footprint. And we walked up the trail that it had came from, and you could see where this thing had pulled a tree limb off this tree, and, and it had taken the small branches on the tree limb and just wrapped them tight, made like a baseball bat out of it. And uh, I was like, man, whatever could rip a limb off like that and twist it, those vines around that limb like it did, as tight as it was. And we went a little bit deeper and um, there was like a rock overhang and up underneath the rock, uh, like, a, you know, it was almost like a bed. Something had carried tw uh, twigs in there and it was like they had pulled every thorn off of them and, and, and threw all these small branches in, up underneath this uh, rock overhang. It's almost like a small cave and uh, almost like a bed up underneath, up in that thing. And uh, I even crawled up in there, and it was like something had meticulously pulled every thorn off. Of, it was like a lot of these were skeet limbs, and they have thorns on them. And every every thorn had been taken off, you know. And but the but the limbs were thrown up underneath there, like it was making a makeshift bed. And uh, and we never saw the thing again. Thank goodness, you know. <laughs> and I, I saw enough of it that day. That <laughs> so what was the next thing that happened to you? What uh... Did you, well, what happened after that? What's the next, I stopped, next event? Yeah, I stopped telling that story for years because people just didn't want to believe it, you know, and and, uh, and people had a hard time wrapping their head around it. And I just thought, uh, I'm tired of people laughing at me when I tell that story. But, and, uh, well, and I, went I, to, and, I went to the Sasquatch Museum up, up north of me. And there's a, if you ever get out to Georgia, out to the Blue Ridge, Blue Ridge Georgia, there's a, there's a very nice Sasquatch museum up there. That ah. has a lot of uh, original stuff in it that came from various researchers. So. Oh yeah, but this this area right here in Texas, where I'm from, uh, the Caddo, Texas, is just about 20 miles north of me. And most people here of Caddo, Texas, they think it's off out in the swamps and stuff out there where the uh, Boggy Creek. Uh, film was recorded and stuff, but actually, Caddo, Texas is is kind of up here in north central Texas. It's a little community about 20 miles up here. They had one of the first Bigfoot sightings. There was two families up there that were neighbors with each other, and and one lady had they had five dogs killed, and something was scaring the hell of them at night. And uh, and uh, there's one old rancher up there, Mr. Peterson's, and this thing was throwing rocks at the house and raising hell with his dogs. And I think he he had had a dog killed, and the other dog that had started keeping in the house. Cause he was out there fighting with it every night 
and this thing was throwing rocks at the house and then they had crawled on the house and and uh and uh the rancher peterson he had, had a six he had a he had a revolver he went out there and uh and it was on top of the roof and he he emptied his revolver into the damn thing and then went back inside to reload it <laughs> you know so he got up close and personal with it and everybody in this whole area was just frightened to death and it was in the newspaper and it was in the news and just scaring the living hell out of everyone it's one of the wildest bigfoot stories that you'll ever come across but not many people have ever ever heard of it it's called the, you can research the cattle critter they call it and well, it's one of the first bigfoot sightings here in texas yeah when you go into the sasquatch museum in uh blue ridge georgia um the very first thing you see when you walk in the door to your to the left to your left is a a map of the United States and it's got all these pins in it, uh, yeah. and the pins represent sightings. And we asked the people there how many sightings are there in the United States so far, and it's over three thousand sightings in the United States. So that's it's quite a few, and some of them some of them are even close here in close to Atlanta, I mean, in places you'd think could never, would it would never venture, you know, where there's a lot of humans. But right. anyway, go to your, uh, go to your first uh, interesting event after your Sasquatch event. What was the next thing that happened to you? How old were you? When did it happen? All that stuff. Uh, okay, but yeah, right before we get get there, uh, I'll tell you that I went to, I went to Roswell UFO Festival and I got a chance to hang out with some other uh, experiencers and stuff. And I think there was five of us there in the room having a conversation. And I think four of the five, not only had they seen aliens or UFOs, they had seen Bigfoots. And I thought, there's got to be something to that, you know. So maybe the, 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 the Bigfoot thing and the alien thing is connected, you know. Maybe the Bigfoot are ET of some sort. Well, the, quite a few people have seen them disappear, you know, right as they're looking at the thing that disappears, right? While while they're look while they're looking at it, and uh, I was walking in front of there's a lady's house that I used to walk past uh, down by um, down by Morgan Falls Dam, which is not too far you know it's walking distance from my house, and I walked past this lady's house and I I could see it looked like somebody was standing on the porch, but it wasn't the person I was looking at wasn't clear. I couldn't focus my eyes on this lady or person standing there. And then all of a sudden, uh, it disappears. I'm looking straight at this uh, human or whatever it is. And uh, and it starts disappearing while I'm looking at it. But it go it disappears from the head down. It's not all it not all instantly. It kind of it's like. you know, it starts disappearing at the head and then ends at the feet, but it's really fast. But I knew that was a ghost, but I'd never <laughs> seen I'd never seen a full bodied apparition in my life. I've seen a lot of uh, disincarnates, but they never look like solid. And this right. thing looked solid, except it didn't have any it didn't have any. Um, there was no depth. It was like it was on a like on a flat screen. And uh, I couldn't get a focus on it. It had no depth, and it disappeared while I was looking at it. So I knew that wasn't real human. Right. So yeah. anyway, go go to your next uh, event, uh, uh, paranormal event, or or right. alien event, or whatever you got next. Okay. Yeah, you know, like uh, I'm, I'm working in the oil field, working out there at night. Sometimes I'd work like straight uh, nine months of nights, uh, like it. In the afternoon to early in the morning and and i've seen everything you could see out there and uh you know you see all these meteors and stuff like that at night you're wondering if maybe some of them could be ufos but uh one time i seen the uh it was a space shuttle come in it came in over california and it, and it landed in florida and it flew right over texas where i was working and so i got to see what I thought, well, this would be a good chance to see what something from outer space would look like when it's coming in at night, you know. So, and uh, and when I seen the space shuttle come in and make its re-entry, and there was like, uh, I was, I was like, man, I ain't never seen anything like that. I mean, it's, it was like a slow-moving fireball, 
that was easy to spot and it went slowly across the sky and behind the fireball was a brilliant white rainbow and it, and it probably stayed there five to ten minutes after the space shuttle had went plumb out of sight and and it was like wow if that's what something uh, coming in from outer space looks like you wouldn't miss you wouldn't miss it you i mean you you would see it and i saw at that point i kind of didn't really i thought oh, well everything i've seen has just been space rocks and space junk and stuff like that so i didn't really I didn't really believe in UFOs at that point. Uh, now, about 2009, I, I was working over here north of Cisco, Texas, and uh, and uh, when I go in that area every Wednesday night, I was seeing these strange lights. They would come on, they would go off, they would move about the treetops, they would disappear. Uh, I mean, I seen one drop 200 feet to a field and then pop up 200 feet to the point where it was at just prior to that. And then it was joined by a second one that came out of nowhere. And then they took off together and, and just weird stuff that was just, a, just I've seen everything you could see out there, but I, there was no explanation for this. And I even contacted uh, the MUFON investigator and a MUFON investigator came over there. One went right off the top of his head. And he called me like about 10 o'clock at night, one night. And he goes, man, he said, one of them just went right on top of my head. He said, I don't know what it was. <laughs> I don't know either. These are I call them mystery lights. I didn't know what they exactly what to think of them, you know. But I, I suspected, you know, maybe they're some kind of alien probe or something like that. Who knows? You know, if we send in probes to other places, why wouldn't so, somebody intelligent send that same kind of stuff here? You know, it really wasn't so, big enough to be a UFO. I mean, so it just how, falls how, of light. How, how far are you from Marfa? Uh, I, yeah, I used to live just down the road from Marfa, so you know. So I've I've been over there and looked at the Marfa lights and stuff like that, you know, so, several times. Yeah. Well, how does what you're talking about compare to the Marfa lights? Well, the, the Marfa lights they were they were like further away and uh, moving across the top of the uh, closer to the ground, where you really couldn't, you know, they were they they stayed fairly fairly close to the ground. And these things were a little bit higher up in the air. And they were, and these things were a lot closer than I was to the Marfa lights, and these were a lot brighter, and uh, and they were moving about the treetops. I mean, they would be 15, 20 feet above the treetops, not making a sound, and just, and then I've seen see the light sequence. They would come on, and then another one would come on, and then the third one would come on, then a the fourth one would come on, the back one would go out, and then reappear in the front, and uh, and I was so like, what color, size, shape? Uh, they were they look they looked to be round and they didn't really look like lights they looked like uh, illumination shining from inside something else it was like in uh, several times several of the lights I've seen also looked the same way it's not like a light itself projecting light out of the craft it's like an illumination and it's like what you're seeing the light in it's like some kind of a circular window or vent and it's something illuminating inside it and lighting up. And, uh, and then after I started noticing that this thing, the back one would go out, then the first one would reappear. And then I realized that it seemed like the thing is rotating and it seemed like it always rotated counterclockwise. And it was like the light on the back would go out and you would see something on the front rotating into view. It wasn't like it just appeared, but it just rotated into view. So you're talking about a single object, not multiple objects. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, we, we started seeing a lot of these sequencing lights, too, and, and everybody else was seeing them. Everybody had their own ideas of what it was. They were thinking it was not training military aircraft, but helicopters. And I'm like, man, you can hear a helicopter for five miles away. You know, this thing's 200 yards away and not making a sound. So did you, <laughs> did you get a did you ever get an idea of the shape of the craft as opposed to the light? No, you, I, it was the shape of the craft. You could never really see it. I finally did get to see one. And, uh, and it was black. It was in the daylight in the late afternoon, and it was black and hazy, and you couldn't really make it out. It was almost like it had some kind of a stealth uh, going on. It was the, You could see the craft. It looked like it was, uh, man, it had to be 60 yards long or something like that, and it was dark colored, but it was hazy like it had a real – like it had some kind of filter over it or something and, and you could then you could then the lights came on inside it the same lights about the same distance apart and uh and i seen the four lights come on in this thing and it was daylight and i and i was actually following this thing in my truck in the late afternoon and then it just uh it just went translucent i mean it went from where you could see it to where it just like 
it just wasn't there anymore. You you I never shot off. It just went invisible. So I think it had to be like some kind of stealth or something that was using. And it wasn't maybe it was malfunctioning or something was the reason I could see it in the first place. But when it tra went translucent, it just uh, it just went translucent. I mean, it looked like a mirage or something like that. Like you could see it just it went from being where you could see it to not being able to see it. <laughs> and I suspected it was probably still there in the same place. I just couldn't see it anymore. So I assume you have missing time. Not really that I'm aware of because, I mean, I was out there hauling crude oil. I had a load of crude oil on my truck. I know how long it takes to turn that. No, and, no, I don't mean yeah, that stuff event. Like that. I mean, I don't mean yeah. missing time from that event. I mean, in general, that you've ever had missing time. Have you ever had missing time? No, not, not that I'm, you know, not that I could just really pinpoint and say, okay, that, you know, so that wasn't right. You know, I've heard people talk about missing time, but I can't really say for sure that I've seen missing time to that extent. You know, a lot of my sightings were occurring in real time and uh, and I could see the whole, I, I was there the whole thing, the whole time it was there and then when it disappeared, you know, <laughs> so, and then. It wasn't much later that I seen that it was a cattle abduction. I, I was, I was going, I was, it was in that same area, but it was not the same place. It was like, uh, I travel in uh, probably half a dozen counties picking up uh, my crude oil at night. And it was like, no matter where I went, they always could find me. You know, it was, it was like, I couldn't go out there. I worked like three days and then two nights and I couldn't go out there when I was working my two night schedule that I didn't see something. And, and this went on for probably a month or two. And uh, I was talking to me and they're going, get some pictures, man. You got to get us some pictures, you know? And, and I'm like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, people have to take my word for it. I want to be able to provide, provide pictures. So I had a camera and I had, I kept it charged up and ready to go, you know? And, uh, and, the, and the craft in the afternoon I actually was trying to get a picture of it and my camera opened up and then the display never came on. And that camera, I don't know what happened to it, if it just decided to die at that time or if they did some something to it. But it opened up and uh, and it and the display never came on. And, and I put new, I changed the batteries out in it and the camera it ruined the camera. The camera was useless after that. I mean, the lens opened up like it's supposed to. The display never came on and the camera never worked again. Now, to this day, I put new batteries in it, and and I had people look at it, and they said, "Man, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it it's completely burned up." You know, it's like I don't know if they did something to it or what. But how many times have you uh, had encounters with actual beings as opposed to craft in the sky? Well, it was in uh, I think the first I had a uh, I seen the I seen the catalog when I seen the cattle abduction. Uh, there was uh, six lights in the sky and then there was three more came on and there was like nine total lights. Then three of the lights broke off from the array, traveled over to my left about a quarter mile off out in this cow pasture. And I was actually rolling down the highway looking at all this going on and this thing rolled down there and I could see there was a, uh, the craft went lower to the ground and there was a dark blue beam came out of it. And, uh, and then there was a, a humanoid figure in the field walking around and it had this yellow glow around it and you could tell it looked like a bobblehead doll i mean the head was way too big for the body and you could see this thing out in the field and it had this yellow glowing light around it and then under the craft above it i couldn't get a good look at the craft but there was a there was a the array of three lights and it had a dark blue beam shining out of the bottom of it and then I, I was taking all this in and I was actually thinking about stopping and just observing it because I was fixing to start driving past it. And then I looked into the blue light and, I, and, the, and the blue light, I could see something dark blue rising. It was about 30 feet off the ground and continuing to, to climb an elevation. And I couldn't tell what it was. I didn't know if it was smoke or what it was, but there was definitely something in the light that was rising up into that craft uh, besides the humanoid walking on the ground over there. And when I got... A little bit closer it came into view it was a cow and it was being lived it was about 30 feet up there and right being lifted and then it was whipping its head from side to side as it was being lifted like it certainly wasn't enjoying the ride and when i seen it was a cow being lifted in as high up as that cow was off the ground and, and going higher and uh, the thought of stopping and just observing this went right out the window then i just wanted to get the heck out of here and i was worried this thing was going to follow me 
And so I kept looking up over my truck, making sure that when those those lights went over me, you know. So, but uh, so what? Okay, so what year was this? Do you know? That was about two thousand nine. Okay, and, and you uh, were you were just on I, the rounds picking up oil. Yeah, it was miss, and I would consider those mystery lights. And and uh, when I started, when I seen the cattle abduction, and then I seen the craft in the late afternoon, it became. Uh, very apparent to me that this is a so alien activity that I'm seeing out here, but it's hard. I mean, people are skeptic; they don't want to believe you. And there, are people are. I'm talking to MUFON people, and they're, and I've got other buddies that are telling me, "Don't talk to MUFON. You're going to lose your job. I'm a hazmat driver. I'm going to lose my license and all that stuff." So I had a little bit of fear going on. I, I should probably shouldn't say too much. I mean. I have a haul has just my crude oil and, and I have a hazmat license and your employer don't want the kind of people working for them that, that, that see aliens and stuff like that. You know, they think you you may have to go to some six month psychological evaluation and you don't want to have to do that. So I was kind of torn between how much I could say and who I could say it to and uh, well, trying to protect the job and myself and take, but, take at the same time. Take us uh, back to the when you saw the humanoid out in the field, uh, you, you're looking out in the field, the crafts in the sky, the cattle's getting lifted. The humanoid itself, can you be a little more specific about the description of the what you were seeing, the, the humanoid? What? I know it, it, look, it had thin, frail arms and legs from what I could tell from the distance. Like I said, it was probably a quarter mile away. And uh, I could tell that the, in the head, you could see from that, even from that distance, you could see that the head was very disproportionate for the body. And uh, and this thing it wasn't real short. I mean, it looked like it may have been, it may have been five, six feet tall, maybe. I don't know. Uh, from that distance, it's really hard to tell. But I, it had this strange, and this light, it was like a fluorescent. Uh, it was just a fluorescent glow around this creature, and it, you could see it shining on the creature. On the, uh, I don't know if it's a suit or what it was, but you could see the light, the light on the ground as well around it. You know, so I don't know. I couldn't tell exactly what it was doing, but I know it was on the ground, and that while the cattle was being lifted up in the air over there, and uh, I would say. From where the cow was being lifted, it was probably 50 yards, 50, 60 yards from where the humanoid was, the location was. But, you, and, but uh, it was a quarter mile away, so that's pretty far, pretty big distance. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't right beside the cow. He was a little ways from the cow, man, where, I mean, where the cow was being lifted. The humanoid was how far from you? Oh, for me, I, I want to say a, a, maybe a quarter mile. Yeah, that's, that's maybe a little less. Yes, that's still a pretty good distance. I mean, yeah, so yeah, that's, but you could definitely tell it was a humanoid. I mean, it had two it had two legs, two arms, and a giant head. <laughs> what on giant head on it? So, what color was the humanoid? Everything about the thing was had this greenish yellow glow. Uh, it was like he was, and it. it it looked like he was holding something that was making light or he had something on him that was making light. I couldn't really tell from that distance that he had a flashlight or anything like that, but there was just a, there was a real bright yellow green glow around him. And I don't exactly know what was causing the glow. I couldn't tell uh, what, what was causing the glow, but it was like, the, but it was, you could see his body was lit up with it, with the glow and the glow was on the ground around him. And it was just lighting up the whole little area that he was around. So I have no idea what what that was about. So go to your next uh, your next interesting experience. That's that's more than and it, you know we're not. Um, I don't think lights in the sky. You know, Mufon um, has never been that exciting to me because they're always focused on lights in the sky. They never focus on abductions. So go go yeah. forward until you get to a something that's more interesting than lights in the sky. Yeah, like I said, we're you know I was dealing with skeptics and stuff like that, and and I was like, well, you know, if, even if you do get a decent picture of these lights in the sky, it doesn't really prove anything. I mean, a skeptic's going to just tell you, well, that's just street light. 
it's, it could be anything, you know? So I'm thinking, I was thinking to myself, I said, man, you know, you really, how are you going to prove something to these skeptics and scholars that it's not just lights in the sky? So when you want to, when you take a picture of these things at night, even if you do catch a picture of them, it doesn't, it's not going to prove anything to these guys. And so I came up with this idea, uh, green, these powerful green lasers had just come out. And I thought, you know what? I said, I ordered me a 250 milliwatt green laser that would shine a beam about five miles. And I ordered it from China. And uh, I got this thing in. I was pretty amazed at how bright the beam was on this thing. And I thought, man, you know, if I could, if you could, if you could actually video type a UFO and, and if this, if that craft's propulsion system is bending time and space around it, if you shine that light on that craft, it should make that light appear to bend. You know, just like a black hole bend, it makes light appear to bend if it's because of the fabric of space is bent. So uh, I was like, if something like that is going on and you can catch it on video with the laser being fired at the craft, then you then you would actually have some solid evidence to prove to the skeptics and scholars that this is an alien craft, something that could be in time and space, something that we can't do. So. I'm thinking every, you know, this is the thinking outside the box way to prove that this is the ET that we're seeing out here, and I can have some solid evidence to present to the skeptics scholars that this is ET craft visiting Earth. And uh, so I, I had a buddy agree to help me on this, so we were up at his house on, up here in Ranger, Texas, on the edge of town, and I said, man, I've had like, and I, and I had, I've had two craft sightings in like six days or something like that, and I was like. Man, I am seeing them. You know, it seemed like they always find me no matter where I'm at. So maybe if we're up here, they will find me again. And I said, I got the laser. I'll I'll shoot the laser around the craft. And I said, you got the camera and you can video record it. All right. So I don't know if he really believed me, but he agreed to go UFO hunting with me. And uh, so we're up here. We're we're hoping to pull this off and, and uh, frustrated there for a long time because we heard military jets in the area and we were like, there's no way that these guys are not going to come around these jets. And uh, finally the jets left and I was about ready to give up and call it a night. And, uh, and my friend said, he goes, he said, look, man, he said, what is that? And, and I looked and, and it was the same, it was a same four light craft that I'd been seeing. And the lights were the same distance apart. And uh, this thing, I want to say it was probably it's probably a sixteenth of a mile away, maybe 100, 200 yards, something like that away. And it was it was probably two or three hundred feet up in the air. I mean, it was it was relatively close to where we were at. And I was going, that's it, that's it, that's what I'm talking about, man. That's the same thing. That's the same craft, same four light craft I've been seeing. And. Uh, and anyway, so I said, all right, man, I'm going to shine the laser around it. So I shine the laser around it, and I assume he's got the camera all there running, but I'm shining the laser around this thing, and I'm going, man, I'm not seeing it. It's not, I don't see no beam deviation. I said, I'm, I said, all right, I'm going to shine it on the side of this thing. And it was scary because I thought, man, they might take this wrong. <laughs> we might be two piles of ash sitting here. So it was pretty frightening to pull this off. So I said, I'm going to shine it on it, man. I said, we may regret it, but I'm going to shine it right on. So I shined it on the, on the UFO itself. And then, uh, I figured it would like, you know, light up like you signed it on the side of a car. Maybe it would reflect it off like a mirror. You'd be able to see it shooting off at an angle, but nothing, the beam hit it and it just absorbed the beam completely. It was like you were shining it on something black and dull. It just completely absorbed the beam, no reflection, didn't light up the side of the UFO or nothing. I said, my God, man, it's just absorbing it. It's just absorbing the light. And I said, I hope you're getting all this on the camera. And I looked over at him, and he's got his hands on his hip, and he's just gawking at this thing. And the camera's, like, within arm's reach of him. And he had never seen a UFO before. <laughs> so he was just flabbergasted, man. He was just staring at this thing with awe. And uh, the, the thought of grabbing the camera and recording all this never even crossed his mind. I said, that camera, I'll get the camera. I, he got grabbed the camera, pointed at the thing. He's trying to get the camera up and running. And by the time he gets the display to come on the thing, this, this four light craft just blinks out. It just disappears, man. I mean, it don't shoot off nothing. Don't make a sound. It's just four lights go to nothing. And uh, no sign. I mean, if it was an aircraft or something like that, you'd see the aircraft lights, nothing. It was just it that sky i just went completely dark and uh, i was like man he goes man, i'm sorry man and he goes he goes i was just trying to figure out what it was <laughs> so uh 
but what got interested was the next night. I, I think I must have I might, might have pissed them off a little bit or something. I don't know. Shining that laser on their on the UFO. The next the next night things got really inter- interesting. That was the night of the alien home invasion. I mean, I came home from work. I have I have an indoor house cat, and uh, and the first thing I know when I come in a, I come in my house. I have a I have a girlfriend that lives ten miles away. She's going to college and stuff. And so she's living in an apartment in Easton, but it's just me and the cat here in my house in Ranger, Texas at the time. And uh, I come home and the cat's not in the house and, and I, I can't figure out where he's at. Well, I go looking for him and I see there's a huge uh, in my third bathroom. And, and that's that's the room where his litter box is at. And and uh, there's a huge uh, hole clawed in the floor. Now, this is a declawed cat. And uh, how there could be a huge whole clawed in the floor is just a mystery it was, and he was a full-size man coon big cat and and the hole was so big that he had escaped through the hole underneath the house and i'm going how in the world did he do that and i start calling in the hole for him and his name was strapper and i was going strapper strapper you under there and i could hear him meowing up underneath there and i'm thinking he's under there so i'm like um, I got the light on the bathroom and I'm looking through the hole and uh, I can hear him yelling. He sounds like he's pretty close. So I stick my arm off in the hole. The hole's big enough. I can stick my whole arm off in there. I'm stick my, my arm in the hole and I'm feeling around for the cat. And, uh, and he never comes to me. And, and cause I'm on the, I'm thinking I can grab him and pull him back up through the hole. But I, and I pull my arm out of the hole and I look down there and there's a couple of scary looking eyes looking up at me. And I can't guarantee you that they were the cat. I don't know. And I thought, man, you're crazy for sticking your arm off in that hole. It could be anything down there here in Texas. You know, it could be a coon. It could be, I don't even know what's underneath there. And uh, so I went outside and the blocks that go, that go to my access panel had been pulled away. And these are big, heavy blocks. I don't know. I don't know how they got pulled away like that. It's like something had pulled them away and had had crawled up underneath the house somehow. And uh, so I pulled the blocks away, took the screen down and uh, started calling the cat. And luckily, the cat came to me, came running out the hole and I grabbed him and I pushed the blocks back up. And uh, I went and had some 30, 30 year roofing tin that I used to, and I put screws in the tin to hold it to the floor where he couldn't escape again. And still, I was wondering how he made that hole in that floor, and and, and I'm kind of frustrated. So I'm, you know, it's it's getting it's time to go to bed because I have to get up at like four thirty in the morning. So I'm like, okay, it's it's about nine o'clock. It's time to turn in. Well, I need leave enough lights on around my house. I can go get a drink at night. I can go to the bathroom without falling over stuff. So and I'm living here by myself, so ain't nobody to tell me what I can and can't do like there is now. But <laughs> but so I, I leave quite a bit of lights on in the house where I can see around. Well. I know I go in there to lay down. I lay down in my bed and I mean, I hadn't even, I had no sooner hit that bed and, uh, and I'm laying there and all of a sudden I hear, I hear glasses and stuff get knocked over in the kitchen. And I'm thinking, what a cat is just, boy, he's being a pain today, man. I'm going to have to get up and go see what's going on in there. And, uh, and then I realized that some, I was stuck in that bed. I mean, I don't know what happened, but I was like frozen I could think I, uh, I didn't feel anything holding me down, but when, every time I tried to move, it was like some kind of force would just like push me into that bed. It was like, there, it was no way. I mean, it was like, I was completely paralyzed. I mean, I couldn't move my legs. I couldn't move my arms. I could move my eyes a little bit. It seemed like I couldn't really move my head. I, and I, and it, I don't know what, and I'm thinking, man, I'm having some kind of heart attack or something. And I keep now, and I keep hearing glasses get knocked over there. And, and now all of a sudden, I'm hearing cabinet drawers open up, and I'm here, I'm hearing uh, the drawers of the stuff being open. I'm the cabinets are being open, and stuff's getting knocked over. And I think, and I'm going, okay, well, I'm paralyzed in bed. I've got some kind of medical condition, and I, and I look out the door. I still hear stuff going on inside there. And there's the cat standing right outside my bedroom door. And he's looking back towards the kitchen. Like he's concerned, like something else is in the house. And and then while he's standing there looking back towards the kitchen, more sounds are from coming from the kitchen. So I realized, okay, it is not the cat making these sounds. I'm still in bed and, and I'm paralyzed in bed and I can't move. I can't get up. I don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden something streaks by the living room door. 
the, the door to my bedroom goes to the living room. Something streaks by, and whatever this thing is moving so fast, you can't even get it. You can't it, you can't see it. It's just a brown streak. And I and and I'm I'm hoping I've had I've had like uh, squirrels fall through my uh, drop down ceiling before. I've had to catch them with like a trout net and a leather glove, and 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 take them back out of the house. Is it's occurred not often, but every now and then. I'm thinking, wow, maybe I've got squirrels in the house. <laughs> you know, maybe it's a coon, maybe it's a squirrel, who knows what it is. It's, it's certainly explainable, but I've never seen anything move this fast, you know. And then I seen another one. There was a second one, and they're running around here. They knocked a lamp over at my computer desk in the living room and, and broke the bulb in it. And then all of a sudden, I hear them opening drawers. Uh, have a I have a uh, like a coffee table that's got drawers. I hear the drawers open into this coffee table, and I'm thinking that's squirrels. I have a hard time picture squirrels opening drawers. And uh, then the next thing you know, I seen a, I seen one of these things run across a vertical wall. Like gravity didn't even affect it. And I'm going, oh shit, okay. And uh, then it, then I seen one run up the wall, push off the ceiling, and run straight back down. And I'm going, oh, shit, I don't know what these things are. And I've started to put two and two together. This probably had more to do with what went on last night than just animals in my house. And uh, and then all of a sudden, a, a third one came onto the scene. This third one came onto the scene, and he stopped right in front of the bedroom door. I mean, this thing is like uh, 10 feet away. He ran in on all four legs, and it was just a streak. He, but when he stopped, I could see him clear as day. This thing stopped on, you know, on all fours, reared up on two feet. He looked like he was about 18 inches tall. He had a humanoid-looking face, but that was the only thing about this thing that looked human. Everything else on this thing looked like it. It had an exoskeleton shell on it. It had thorn appendages hanging off uh, of the exoskeleton shell. Now, this thing's face looked like an angry old man. I mean, it had, it had big eyes, but they were squinting like what little light in the room was hurting it. It, it had... Uh, a human looking nose and it had a very tight mouth i mean almost no lips on on the mouth at all but just you could tell that the the face kind of looked humanoid but everything else man about this thing looked more like an insect than it did a, it, a human and the hands on this thing were, were uh, uh i don't know they were long and uh, almost insect looking themselves you know maybe some claws on the tips of them and uh very muscular rear legs uh you can see the muscles in this thing's legs and uh and i sitting there looking right at this thing i think my god you know i was like hope they hope they just take whatever the hell they want and stay out of here and uh these things i mean and it was like that it was like the third one came in i don't know the other two they were like running around like crazy not doing much but after the third one came in they really started doing a search They've started searching through the computer drawers and stuff like that. And uh, just they had every drawer and every cabinet in the whole damn house opened up. And I'm still paralyzed in this damn bed. And the cat has retreated in there to the bed where I'm at. He jumped up on the bed and I'm paralyzed, but it, he doesn't seem to be affected at all. I mean, he's walking around the, the top of the bed like nothing's wrong with him. And I'm thinking, and he'll, and he, he's looking at those things in the living room just like I am, and I'm, I'm going, go kill one, you know. <laughs> but he just, he's, he's scared, and I'm, and I'm, I'm pretty horrified, and I'm just hoping they just get the hell out of here. And, uh, and I realized the harder I fight to get up or get loose, the, the more it hurts, it, and, and there was just wasn't no way to fight it. And, uh, and eventually. I'd hope these things would stay out of the bedroom where I was at, but that didn't happen, man. I mean, I've seen three streaks. All three of them ran up into the bedroom at one at one instance, not one at a time, but it was almost like all three of them run together, and they ran up underneath the bed, and they start picking the whole bed, the box springs, the mattress with me on it, up off the floor and slamming it back to the floor. They're picking it up about two inches off the floor and slamming it back down, and the cat bails, man. I mean, he Take, he jumps off that bed and runs out that door, and I see him sliding around the corners the last I seen of him. And uh, these things are up underneath the bed, and they're slamming the bed, and they're picking me and the bed springs and the mattresses and everything up. And uh, and then I hear, and then they stop bouncing the bed. And they're bouncing me off the mattress at one point. I'm bouncing off the mattress. They're, they're shaking this thing so hard. But then all of a sudden, they stop bouncing the bed, and they start clawing into the box springs underneath the bed i can i can hear their claws scratching on the wood underneath there they're pulling that stuff 
It's not like they're gutting the mattress, and I'm thinking at any time they're, they're fixing to feel them claws in my back, and I'm still paralyzed in this damn bed. And I'm starting to think I'm going to die. I'm going to freaking die here. Now, you can be scared all you want, but at some point, after a while, if you be scared long enough, you finally get mad. And I was like, hey, it's, it's, gonna, it's either me or me. I'm going to have to kill them or they're going to kill me. And I thought to myself, I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, whatever it takes, I'm going to break free. And uh, I'm going to break free. I had a golf bag in the corner. I'm going to grab a club out of there and I'm going to kill me some damned aliens. And uh, and so I tried to break free and tried to get loose. And, and I mean, it almost had, I almost had a heart attack this time. It felt like my heart stopped. I could, I could almost couldn't breathe. And uh, and and I realized, so my God, I can't do it. I'm at their mercy now, completely at their mercy. They're ransacking my house. They're scaring the hell out of me, and I'm completely at their mercy. Can't do a damn thing. And then I hear them over by the gun cabinet, and that gun cabinet just happens to be where the laser I was using the night before was being kept. And I was thinking to myself, "You're not going to get in there, you suckers, because it's locked up. I know good and well it's locked up." And uh, and then all of a sudden that. I was thinking, as long as they ain't not trying to mess with me in the bed anymore. And then all of a sudden, it got quiet. They just took off. And I thought, well, oh, my God, they got the laser. They got the laser or something. I don't know. They took off. And all of a sudden, just the weirdest thing out of the blue. Man, I screamed and I cussed. My body jumped up, jumped up out of that bed in a fit of anger. And I grabbed that golf club. And uh, I was in a fit of rage. Now, I had tried to do this five minutes earlier without success. It was like they blocked the signal to my brain. And once they released me, that was the first thing that got processed. And I had to try to do this five minutes earlier and, and couldn't do it and given up. And all of a sudden, uh, that signal got processed. Man, I, I mean, I jumped out of that bed and I was screaming and cussing and I had a golf club in my hand. And I thought, well, hell, I might as well go with it, you know? So I went on an alien hunt. I went to the kitchen, I searched all the dark corners of my house. And that you could see where they had broken some dishes in the kitchen. They had broken the lamp on the computer. Every cabinet and drawer in the whole damn kitchen was open and at, everywhere. I mean, they had opened every damn drawer and cabinet in the whole damn house. And uh, I finally had circled back to the bedroom and looked up underneath the bed to make sure they went up underneath there. And I'd seen where they had tore into the box spring cover underneath the bed. And uh, I and I was over by the gun cabinet, and I thought, ah, the gun cabinet's locked. But I looked, and I thought one of the doors looked open, and I looked, and the door, both doors of the gun cabinet were open. And then I was kind of frustrated because here I am chasing damn aliens in my house with a golf club, and I got a perfectly good loaded shotgun right there in that gun cabinet. But the reason I didn't get the, get the, the shotgun in the first place was because I would have had to go get the key to unlock it, you know, so – and then when I realized it was open, the shotguns right there, I could have had a shotgun the whole damn time instead of a set of a golf club. And but I looked at I couldn't ever didn't find the aliens anywhere. I went back in uh, to where the cat, where the hole was, where the cat had escaped. And the tin I had put over that floor had been pried up. They had pulled the screws right out of the wood and pulled that tin up enough to crawl back out of the hole. And uh, I thought, man, you know. It may have been those guys that made that hole all along, and not the cat. And so I had to get some more screws and screw the thing back down into the wood so the cat wouldn't be able to escape from it. And I had to bring my my but my buddy came over the next day. He said, I said, look, Al. I said, uh, I told him what all went on. He said, man, I don't doubt it after what we saw. And I said, I, I, I said, well, I, I said, I need you to help me do something. I said, I want you to just stand right here and have the phone. I said. I said, I can't live in this damn house and wonder if these things are up underneath there. I said, I've searched the house and hadn't seen them anywhere. I said, I'm going to have to crawl up underneath this house in the dark. And, uh, and I, man, I had a, had a, had a spotlight on my, on my head. I had a gun in one hand and a, and a knife and a hunt knife in the other. And, uh, and you wouldn't want to run on these things. These things are small, but I mean, they were light and fast, man. I mean, you would not want to encounter them up underneath there, but I wasn't going to be able to live in this house. I would have to sell this house and move our man up and get up underneath there and make sure those damn things ain't nested up underneath there. And I was willing to make that effort so I could sleep, have a good night's sleep and, and not wonder if they're up underneath there. And so it was scary. I crawled up underneath there and uh, there were no aliens up underneath there. And I could see where the wood had been clawed and torn, uh, you know, and, I looked in the area where they had clawed the damn hole in the floor, 
And it just, and it, it's a strange deal. You know, these guys, that's the only time I've seen these ETs was these little guys, but they were like a recon team ordered by something else, I'm sure. And I found out later, probably that is the case. Uh, you know, I ain't so sure that these ain't like little contract workers you know, that do recon for these other beings that I encountered later. So how many um, alien, how many different alien encounters have you had with actual beings in your life so far? Did those little know? guys, yeah, those that those guys were up close and personal. And then the cat lady, I've been up close and personal to her. And then the tall blue lady, I've been up and close and personal to her. And uh, some of the and some of the other creatures, I have several other creatures that I've managed to capture on film on the on the UFO mothership. And uh, I mean, these guys were probably I recorded them from like a mile away. I mean, I wasn't up close and personal with them, but there's several. Uh, different beings on top of the the mothership that I recorded. I got a 17 seconds of video. I think seven seconds of it actually have the left half of the mile long mothership on it. And on the surface of that craft, there is these, there are several different beings on the surface of this thing. And they're all very large beings. I mean, crazy large, big 40 feet tall insectoid looking thing. It looks like a praying mantis, except praying mantis's arms don't come out of their back. This is a praying mantis that has arms that come out of its back like a spider. I even showed it to a zoologist, and and he said, "Man, I'm you know I'm, I know every creature on the planet." And he said, "I've never seen that." You know, I said, "I because I don't think it's from here." And uh, I mean, there's, I think I lost sound. Yeah, I can't hear you for some reason. You've lost what you lost you lost your sound. That's okay. I, I was talking to my are. wife. She wanted to be in my show. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go ahead, keep going. Yeah. And then uh and after, after that sighting, you know, and it, it was then again, it's like, man, who do you tell that to? <laughs> you know, I was kind of torn. And 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 part of the problem with the experiences is, is, is who, who do you, who can we go to, to tell? I mean, I would have loved to have got a forensic team over here and, uh, to take samples and stuff like that. And, uh, it would have, it would have been worth it, worth the effort. But, uh, I've had people say, why don't you call the police? You know, I'll call the police. And I'm like, yeah. you know, I know the police here in this town. They're going to think you're on a cooking methamphetamine or something. They're, they're not even going to take you serious. <laughs> If we're going to look for the lab, I, I mean, it, it's not going to do you any good to, to tell the police in my little town that. Uh, and I'm going, and then what's my employer? My employer is going to hear about it. What's he going to think? I'm going to have to go through a six month psychological evaluation. And, uh, and, and you're on short term disability if they do that and you make about half what you normally make. And I can't afford to take a 50% pay cut just so that can, I can be psychologically evaluated. So go to your but, next. Go, uh, hold on a second. Let me put myself back on screen. So go to your next uh, encounter with an alien. Okay. You mentioned 40 foot tall. The, you just skipped over something there. Go ahead. Now, now we're headed to that part. Um, <laughs> we're actually ahead, headed to that ahead. part right now. Go there now. That was a, so after, after seeing that, uh, I mean, a year went, a solid year went by. I, I didn't see any lights. I didn't see... And, you know, when you see something like that, you're like, man, that's, you know, as crazy, as scary as that was. Uh, I guess I'll never see anything like that again, you know, and uh, probably that could be a good thing. But at the same time, you're like, man, you know, I can't believe that happened. And now I'm, I'm, for a year, nothing, not nothing. Uh, I, and I, I just figured they were done with me or I'd never see anything like that again. And uh, it was a year later to the day. And that was the weird part of it, it was to the day of the alien home invasion a year later i hadn't seen anything i was working nights uh, down by Coltman, texas and and i'm pulling on this lease and uh, i'm talking to my friend on the phone because i'm driving slow driving on a lease road so i'm talking on my phone and i'm pulling up on the location and uh, all of a sudden there's a there's a ufo on the ground over there and it's a small craft it looked, looked like it had two or three lights on it. it and all of a sudden the lights came on this thing lifted up over the mesquite trees and these mesquite trees ain't 15 20 feet tall 
So this thing lifted up off the mesquite trees, and, and it was probably within 100 yards of me. And, and it was fixing to pass right over the top of my head. So I told my friends, I got to get off here. So you have to I'm trying to get a picture. And so I hung up real quick, tried to get my camera up. I'm hanging out of my driver's side window up to the waist. As this thing sticks to pass over, I'm trying to get my camera up. And this thing, all the lights go out on it right as it's fixing to pass over the top of the truck. And I'm going, damn it. I didn't get it. You know, I didn't catch it. And, and uh, so I pulled up to the battery and I'm, I'm getting ready to start the loading process and stuff. And I'm thinking, man, I bet they're still out there. That, you know, I bet they're going to show back up. And, and and so I start the loading process. And sure enough, the last on a, over over the field, not far from me, probably uh, 300 yards away, probably came on. And uh, I'm going, holy shit, there's lights. That's the lights. And I caught a picture of the lights. Now I'm excited, man, because I finally got. I finally got some of these move on requesting pictures that they wanted so bad. And so I'm just filling my camera full of these stupid lights over the field, uh, which don't prove anything. Complete, I, I found out later that I completely wasted the memory on my phone taking some of these pictures and missed some great opportunities later. But I got a lot of pictures of these lights over the field. And anyway, at one point, uh, this I had this new uh, Motorola Tundra phone, and it actually had video capability. This is a little bit before it's 2011. It's a little bit before smartphones came out, but this was like a uh, military grade flip phone, and it had video capability on it, and you could send pictures. And so it was uh, for you know, and it was like waterproof too. So it was like a great little phone for its for its uh, for its time, and uh, and I thought, well. You know, if I can really get something to take a video, I'll take a video of it. But I want, it needs to be something really, something good. So I looked and I said, the lights came back on. And I seen that the lights descended to some trees out there, uh, probably a quarter mile or a little bit less away. And I could see through the mesquite trees that the, the thing had landed on the ground and it had lights on it. It was on the ground. And I thought, well, you know, if I take a video and perhaps we can zoom in and we can see some creatures walking around the craft or something like that. So so I started my video of this thing and all of a sudden I'm recording it through the trees. And it's a long way away. I mean, it's it's, it's a long way away for the phone to be recording. But about but the strangest thing happened. All of a sudden, I, as soon as I got the video up and running, this thing leapfrogged about 200 yards. I mean, it went up and down and landed on the ground again, about 200 yards away. And, and I caught it all on video. And then I still had the video running. I'm going, oh, wow, look at that. And then all of a sudden, it took off. And it, and it looked like it went about a mile in about two seconds. It went up in the air. And it was red, blue, and green, yellow lights. And, and you can see this thing taking off. And I got all of that on video. And uh, I thought, wow, man, I caught all of that on video. And uh, and then all of a sudden, I thought, well, it, it looked like it went about a mile away and stopped. And then it just, the lights went out. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I don't know if there's going to be any more or not, you know, but I'm knowing I'm already starting to get warnings that my camera memory is getting full. Well, so I'm starting to load the crude oil stuff. I'm hooked up. I'm just doing my job, what my employer pays me to do, put the crude oil on my truck. And all of a sudden, the lights come back on again. And this time, they're pretty close. I can see portions of the craft associated with the lights, but I can't see the whole craft. It kind of looked like a dark greenish black around the lights. And uh, and it had these red lights that were stretchy like taffy. Now, I've never seen these lights before, but this looked like it looked like taffy or grease smeared across a mirror. I mean, it was really weird that the, what these lights looked like. And I kept thinking I had water in my eyes. I wiped my eyes to make sure I, did, I wasn't tearing up. And uh, and it, it, it looked the same, you know. And I'm thinking, well, this – and I thought, okay, man. I'm gonna, So I got some pictures of that. And then this thing – all of a sudden, it did something. This thing started moving at me. It started coming right at me. And my truck is lit up like I, there's a carnival going on. I got lights on it, on my truck all over the place. This thing's coming straight at us, man. Uh, and I'm sitting there, and I'm on top of the battery looking at this thing. And and, and as I'm as I'm looking there, all of a sudden, I'm looking at there's a – and you can see it started blocking out the stars. And that was the scary part, man, because the, the stars started disappearing as this thing started approaching. And I can see that it's pretty good size. And it had a had, – had under the belly of it, there was a, a lit compartment. It was a compartment that was lit up in there, and it had that same illumination like I had seen other stuff. It was like it was just illumination inside there, and 
and there was this red glowing light that was stretching like taffy uh, just outside of that compartment. And I'm going, holy cow. And this thing's coming straight at me, man. I'm looking up and I'm seeing the stars disappear. And then I, and I looked up and I seen the edge of the disc, man. It, was, it looked like it wasn't about 40 feet on top of my head. And I'm thinking, oh, shit, they're here. And um, my knees, I wanted to run through the, I wanted to run through the trees, but my knees were shaking so bad that I, it was all I could do to pull off a walk. I, I stumbled down the stairway and I walked underneath the tanks and I looked up and I could see the disc right on the top of me. And I, and I, I thought, man, you know, one spark in this, I've been sucking air in this flammable tank, one spark and this whole damn thing's going up like a bomb. So I closed the loading valve off. Uh, because of what's going on here and then i thought man i got to get away from these tanks so i, I went went over there and hid behind this separator this was my hiding spot i was hiding behind the separator and i had a feeling that i might be going away here pretty quick and and, and then this uh, compartment light up underneath this thing was kind of dim well the light got real bright in it and then i was going oh crap man that thing lit up like a i mean it it got really bright and you could see something looking out. It was it was like something head and shoulders looking out of this damn thing. And uh, and I hid. And I thought, son, they're fixing to come get me. And I thought, man, I'm fixing to be taken. I'm gonna just take my phone. I'm gonna try to get a I'm gonna try to get a picture of this thing. I'm just gonna chunk my damn phone so some people will have a have a clue what the hell happened to me. And I, and I leaned around that separator and I took a picture. I took a picture of that being looking out of that uh, porthole opening window underneath the UFO. And, uh, and and you can see these pictures. All these pictures are posted on Google Images. You can just type in Ronnie Dawson uh, UFO pictures on Google Images. And, and just most of the pictures I took that night will just show up there on Google. And... Uh, and I thought, man, I'm fixing to be going away for a while. And I was scared to death, man. And all of a sudden, this thing, finally, it started backing away. And I'm thinking, oh, thank God, man, this thing. <laughs> I'm all about seeing the UFO, but we're seeing the UFO that that close. You, you'll be grateful with it when it goes away. <laughs> and it, it started back, backing away. And I was like, thank God, this thing is is, is going to, you know, I'm not going to be go taken. I just kept, man, I just had this bad picture in my head of something with slimy fingers running, rushing out of the dark. I looked around, man, it was so dark. And I just knew something was fixing to come running out of the dark, grab me. And uh, when this thing backed away, man, it was such a relief. This thing backed away, then the, out of the field where it first started, then the lights went out on it. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, oh, man, let's get my load on. Let's get the hell out of here. So I started loading again. And, uh, I noticed there was a there was a array of lights. There was I think there was like four lights in the sky. They were white and they were traveling together, but they were covering a pretty good little large area. So it was like four independent things or one huge thing. And this thing was circling my location and spiraling down towards the ground. And I'm going and but after that, well, I, I forgot one part of the story when that when that jet when the UFO backed away, a military jet came to my area i could hear the roar of the jet pass right over the top of the battery i mean it passed right over the top of the battery where the ufo was and i thought we're fixing to see a fight and uh, the ufo blinked out over there the jet went right to where it was at and uh and, and then the jet circled back and uh, i thought well, man, there's no dog fight nothing man you know and uh because i mean the jet was so so low i could see the lights on the tail end of the jet you know I mean, it was it was close to the ground, and it should have been a collision. I mean, it would have collided with right where the UFO was. And this jet circled back towards Dias, and I could hear another one, but I couldn't see it from the other direction go the other way. It's like they were doing a big sweep of the area. And then I started noticing this cluster of four lights that were spiraling down over me, and the, the jets had taken off. And I didn't see that. I didn't see that craft again. But I, I was keeping an eye on this, this, these four lights that were spiraling down. I mean, I was like, what? I wonder what the hell that is. And as this thing started getting closer and started getting lower, it was getting to the point. I was getting my camera ready. I'm thinking, I'm going to fix to get a picture of this, whatever it is. And as this thing started getting lower, man, I could see the, the color of the sky started changing. I mean, it, it was like a white clouds. It was like white uh, embankment of smoke that was rolling through the sky. And, and out of the very front of this thing was this flickering light where it 
it wasn't like a, a airplane light. It didn't have any pattern to it. It was just flash, 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 stop, flash, flash, stop, flash, 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 flash. And it had no pattern to it. And I was watching it the whole time. And the rest of the lights were just staying on. But that front one had a weird, weird pattern to it. But as it came in, I see that, that looked like a fog bank rolling in with this thing. And this light was was the first thing you seen out of it. And this and this thing went right over the top of my head. It was coming right at my truck. And and uh, I got my camera up and I had my display running. And I was getting Mary Mary warnings. And I'm going, man, I got to catch this thing or whatever it is. And I'm short on memory. I tried to do a video and it said I didn't have enough memory for a video. I thought, now i got to switch it to camera. And uh, I can't take a video of it, but I can take a picture of it. So I'm looking at the display screen as this thing's coming in. And it's rolling out of this big fog bank. And this thing, what I thought might be small or four independent items was one huge. This thing started rolling out of that fog bank. Uh, and I mean, this thing just kept coming. And I mean, and, and for the first part passed over me and I could see that that light, it wasn't a light at all. It was something hot that was reacting to the air passing over it. And as the air would pass over it, it almost uh, tried to catch on fire for a second and then blow back out. So it was just something hot on the very tip of this thing. And this thing came in and I was looking up and what I was seeing was it looked like you were looking at the surface of the moon. It was solid rock. There were burn marks. There were craters. There was, uh, it was, it didn't look like an aircraft. I thought at first I thought this is a meteor. This is a giant meteor. Now, you know, I think it's probably to be taken out by a meteor impact. And uh, this thing comes rolling over me and I can see the meteor craters on this bottom of this thing. And this thing, and then all of a sudden, I mean, it's going over me one second, two seconds. It's still passing over me, and it's getting wider and wider. And I'm thinking, and it, and I mean, if it had fell out of the sky, it would have crushed my truck. It would have backed tank battery. It would have, it was a, it, this is a V-shaped craft, and each half of the V is a half mile long. And so it, it took two or three seconds for this thing to pass over me. And I was looking at the other half of the V. I couldn't, I thought it was a solid craft. It looked like it was... I didn't know it even had an opening in the middle till later. It looked like a solid craft. I could see the bottom of both sides of the V, but I couldn't tell there was an opening in the middle. And it was a monstrous craft and it's solid rock. And all of a sudden it starts slowing down. I was like, okay, meteors don't slow down. One thing I'm pretty sure meteors don't slow down. And uh, and this thing, the, the front for, front part that started past me always started tilting up. And uh and all of a sudden they started going straight up, man. I mean, it was like pendulating. And uh, and Bob Lazar, he was talking about uh, pendulating the way the UFOs fly. And, I, and, I, and this is this was exactly what Bob Lazar was talking about. This thing looked like Tarzan swinging from a vine. It was like pendulating, and uh, and it tilted up. And then uh, as it was, it tilted up pretty steep in the first part that first passed over me. And then it, it changed directions and went another day. It changed like it went like 90 degrees from the direction it was traveling. And uh, it, so it made such a transition, so smooth and so easy. But then after it made its turn, man, this thing started accelerating like you wouldn't believe it. It started moving so fast. There was air vortexes were forming to fill the vacuum that it created as it was moving through the air. When you take a big craft like that and you move it at that speed, man, you can just see the air rushing in behind it. The fog I could see rushing over the top of this thing that had been trapped on the surface of it was rushing over the sides of it like water over a waterfall as this thing started accelerating. And and it went it what looked like about a mile, and then all of a sudden it started it started doing it again. It started pendulating up. Well, when it pendulated up, I could see the top of this craft. It, and the top of this craft, it looked like it had a city built on it. And this is like, uh, I mean, you could see structures, buildings. It had a tall tower. It had these uh, blue glowing fluorescent power lines that went from the top of the tower and then stretched across the surface of the craft like, uh, I don't know, like power lines, I guess, laying across the surface of the craft. And they were gro uh, glowing like a fluorescent blue the whole time. And you can see them going through the structures and stuff of this thing. And uh, now, and the tower, I couldn't actually see the tower or if this was another something that was floating above the craft and traveling with it. I mean, I never saw it connected to the tower, the top of the tower. I could see the top of the tower where all the lights were and the power lines going to the craft, but I never could see anything for sure that tied the tower to the craft itself. So I don't know if it was just flying along with the 
with the craft or if it was actually attached to the craft. But it had a tremendous amount of light up there on top of that tower above the craft. And uh, and the the buildings looked like it didn't look like human buildings, man. It looked like uh, I don't know, it looked like something you see at the bottom of the ocean. You know, <laughs> I mean, and, and who knows? Maybe that's where this thing came from. Maybe it was sitting at the bottom of the ocean and they had retrieved it or something. I have no idea. But uh, anyway, thank God I got some video of it because uh, I, I, I was looking at my display screen, deciding, okay, I've got to get a picture or two of this thing. So and. My display screen wasn't showing anything in, in my horror, so I held held the eye of the camera towards this thing, and this thing was so big you'd have a hard, hard time missing it. It filled the whole damn sky, and I clicked record on that damn thing, and uh, what I thought was a picture was actually a video. So I caught seven seconds of video of this thing as it was flying in the air, right there over Coleman, Texas, and uh, this thing's a monster. It's a monster craft, man. I mean, you can't, there's like three radars within that area. Uh, Abilene Regional, 68 miles away. Dias Air Force Base is like 80 miles away, 139 miles away. At Snyder, Texas, there's a 600 mile military radar. So you can't tell me somebody can't see this thing on that radar. And the nice that need to be looked at are March the 1st and March the 2nd. Because I was thinking it was to March the 2nd and then uh, the next morning would be the third but i'm thinking i may have screwed up and it may have been actually the first and the and the second as after midnight and uh this thing when it's when it when it banked i could see the surface of that uh, i could see all the structures on top of this thing and i realized oh my god man this is absolutely amazing man to be beholding this thing and i'm the only one seeing it is it was tragic <laughs> to you know everybody in the world wants to see something like this and I'm sitting there, sitting here with a crappy phone trying to get a picture and a video of it. And anyway, they challenged me to follow FAA low craft report, and I did. And the FAA, uh, they had, we had a phone conference call, and the FAA said that all known craft in the area had been accounted for without incident. And they said I, sh I should report my UFO to New Fork. And I, I made a point in the report never to say UFO. Because I thought they won't get take it seriously. I just said it was a very large craft and it was incredibly too low to the ground for the size of the craft. And I never used the term UFO whatsoever. But the 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 FAA called it a UFO. I should report my UFO. They said to New Fork. So I'm like, I know it's a UFO. The FAA has said it was UFO. And and I did file a low craft report, which is a felony to falsify one of those reports. And you know so. <laughs> Because I know what I, I know what I saw. I got pictures of it, and uh, I'm not and I'm not afraid of the felony, you know. <laughs> so you talk to Peter Davenport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to go to his meetings when I lived in that area. Well, I mean, I found a report. I don't know if I actually, I don't, I don't know if I ever actually got to talk to Peter himself. It seemed like I did. It seemed like at one point he, took, he made contact with me. Well, it he seemed like I just found him. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, go to your your uh, encounter with the cat lady. Okay, it was uh, and it, I think that was uh, March. Uh, that, that was March the second in twenty eleven when that happened, and uh, and so we, we had a lot of. You know, you've heard the hitchhiker phenomena where the ET follows you home and you start having strange anomalies, ghost-like stuff. And uh, it happens to a lot of experiencers, you know. And they call it the hitchhiker theory well, where you, uh, they, they follow you home. Yeah, they 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 uh -huh. basically follow you home, watch you, study you. And, uh, and we were getting some weird stuff going on here at the house. Like kids were catching stuff on cameras. And then I was going, man, I, I don't know what that is. Maybe it's a headlight shining to a curtain. I was trying to make excuses for it. And uh, and then one, and, uh, one night, I was thinking, well, you know, uh, I had my friend over here, Alan. We were doing a UFO video. Uh, we were, I had this uh, video we were making for YouTube called Man, uh, man Escapes Alien Abduction with Pictures to Prove It. And we were making it. He was my cameraman. I was making it here at, at my house on my computer. Uh, with it with I think a cell phone or a cheap camera of some sort and anyway so we're I'm showing what I've captured and telling the story and uh and and my buddy Al he said he said I swear to God man he goes 
I, I just filmed a ghost right there behind your shoulder, man. While, while this was going on, I'm going, what? And we looked and we never, it, and we really couldn't find it. Uh, but after we posted it to YouTube, somebody said, man, hey, what 33 seconds into your video, there's a anomaly appears behind your left shoulder. And we thought, what? Let's slow it down. Let's look at it. And sure enough, man, we, we finally found what he was talking about that day. He said, and we were talking about, I was thinking E.T. probably just, <laughs> E.T. heard us making this video and decided to make an appearance. And uh, and on the Ronnie Dawson YouTube channel, uh, we I took that little clip of that video and uh, I turned the brightness up all the way and I slowed it down to where you could really see what's going on. And you can almost see an E.T., in the in the in the mist you know it makes an appearance and i was like well holy hell that's like it looks like et made an appearance you know et et made an appearance right there on our damn video you know and i've had some people say man that's some of the best paranormal uh, paranormal activity they've ever seen caught on camera you know i looked at they it just appeared it looks like a ghost or something it looks very yeah barely there yeah it's just certainly not uh, almost translucent, you know, and I found out a little bit later and, and, and a little bit more time went by. And, uh, and the, the, one of the weirdest things I ever seen, I, I was in my, in my bedroom, the, the wife was giving the kids their marching orders or whatever. And uh, we we're waiting to go to bed and I'm laying in the, in my bedroom with the bedroom light still on waiting for my wife to, to get to bed. And, uh, I just closed my eyes for a minute and, uh, and the, and the wife hadn't come back in yet, so I opened my open my eyes back up to see where see where everybody's at, and the, there was this mist. It was like a fog that was about two feet above me in the bed, and it was it covered the size of a king size bed. It was a lot of smoke hovering right above me. And at first, I seen it, I couldn't smell anything. And I thought, well, maybe the kids burnt some popcorn in the kitchen, and this fog is just hanging right on the top of my bed, but I can't smell it. And I'm going, oh, what, what the hell that is? And all of a sudden, this whole thing just took off through the wall. It just shot through the wall instantly. And I fell to the wall, man, because <laughs> I thought, man, it's, maybe it's moist or something. And I'm going, I don't know what to think, what, what that was. But, I mean, I saw it in a, in, a, in, a, in a lit up bedroom here at my house. And, and there's no explaining it, you know. I've never seen anything like that since either. It was like I mean, it's like a free roaming vapor that's moving about your house in broad light, you know, and good lighting. And uh, I thought, man, I know we got some ET activity. They're watching me here at the house. They've been in my house. They're st maybe they're studying us. Who knows what? And uh, I was at a, I was at the UFO conference, I think, in 2017, and I talked to Stan Freeman. <laughs> and I said, Stan, you're a smart guy. I said, I said, if I get a chance to talk to these guys, man, I don't want to blow it. You know, what should I say? You know, what should I, is there something I should ask them, you know? And, and, uh, and I think he, Don Smith was there with him. They were hanging out. And, uh, and Don said, well, ask them, ask them how they got here. And he said, tell them, ask them how they got here. And then Stanton said, no, no. He said, tell them to show you how they got here. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I remember that conversation. And it was in August of 2017, and I'd been working nights, and then the next morning I had a, I mean, I was getting in late at night, so sleeping till about noon. And this happened in the early morning, probably about 9 a.m. Uh, it's probably 9, 10 a.m. in the morning when all this went down. And I'm sitting there sleeping. I'm not even dreaming. I'm just tired, resting. And all of a sudden, I, I felt like two women were pulling on my arms like they were, and, and they were trying to pull me like out of a manhole cover or something that I was stuck in. I don't know. They were pulling on me. Then I slipped out of their grasp and I fell back to sleep immediately. And and I didn't wake up, but I was thinking, well, that was a strange dream, you know? And I thought, well, I'm just going to go back to sleep, you know? And then all of a sudden it felt like I started dreaming again. And all of a sudden these gals had me again by the arms that are pulling me. And, uh, and the, the blue lady, she looks at me, she says, help us. And uh, so I start str help, trying to help them pull me out of, get loose from whatever's got me. And they pull me, they pull my consciousness out of my sleeping body. And I'm standing beside the bed. And there are two female aliens standing there and me. And I'm thinking my wife is playing some kind of joke on me. And she's got some friends pranking me or something. I don't know. And, uh, 
and I, I'm I'm looking at their costumes. One is like six foot six tall, and her eyes are as big as our eye sockets. And I'm thinking, oh wow, okay, that is if that's a costume, it's a really good one. And I look at the other one; it's a cat woman, and I mean, she, she looks like a human, but but her face right there, she, she's got eyebrows and eyes like a human, but then her nose and mouth turn into like a lion's mouth. And she's even got whiskers growing out of her top lip that are like trimmed off like three inches long. And, and uh, I'm going, okay, if that's a, if these are costumes, these are some of the best damn costumes I've ever seen. And and she, then she she kind of gave me a quick rundown, you know. I said, we're we're sorry for disturbing your rest. We need to have a conversation. And uh, and I'm taking I'm trying to put two and two together. I said uh, said your your physical body's right there in bed. And I looked and and uh, there is a body in the bed right where I was sleeping and I'm going, Oh the hell, if I'm here, who the hell is that? And so I wanted to walk over and look on down to my own face in the bed. And when I took a step, I almost fell because I was, my knees were literally buried in the bed. And uh, when I took a step, it was like I was in, in water that was knee deep and I fell forward, lost my balance. And I put my hand down to catch myself and it landed on the knee and the body in the bed. And and it and, it, and I, it supported me for a second, and then my hand felt like I broke the leg. I ever who that was. My leg, my hand went right through the bone, right through the meat, and I could feel the softness of the of the mattress underneath it. Like my hand went through the whole damn leg, and I could feel the softness of the mattress underneath it. So I caught myself and I pulled myself back up, freaking out. The two ETs are walking me out, wading me out of the bed. And they said, look, look, you know, you can move to solid matter here. You know, I said, this is the place the people of your world, the people of our world are going to meet. And they said, this is where we have to meet because we're safe from viral and bacterial harm, our physical harm here. This is the safe place where, where the people of your world and the people of our world will eventually meet. And I'm going, oh, OK, all right. And she, and she had me put my hand. She said, put your hand on her face, the cat lady's face. I put my hand on her face. She said, now push. And. I pushed my hand and started sinking into her head and I could feel her hair. I could feel her skin. Then I could feel her brain matter inside her head and it felt wet and moist. But when I pulled my hand back out, cause it was gross, uh, my hand wasn't wet. It was like, I could feel wetness, but I couldn't, you know, it wasn't wet. And I thought, Oh, okay. Well, okay. All right. And I, I said, yeah, so this was safe for physical, harm, physical harm here. I said, yeah, a gun, a gun wouldn't even work here. And they kind of looked at each other like, should we tell him? I don't know if we should tell him or not. And she said, well, we, we have guns that work here. Sadly, wars have been fought here. Battles have been fought here. And uh, I thought, oh, okay. So they got guns, but our guns wouldn't work there. So I'm trying to put two and two together. And they say, we need to have a conversation with you. And they, they gave me like a brief history. They said, we found your world, your nuclear testing sent light and radiation into our interdimensional world. And uh, we, we thought we thought we thought we were gonna be interdimensionally attacked. So we investigated it and we found your world and we didn't, they had been in an interdimensional war with some other people and they thought that we were uh, perhaps a staging area for an interdimensional attack they had had in the past. And so they, uh, they didn't come here to make friends. They came here to investigate us, who the hell we are or what we're doing here. And they found us. Uh, because of our nuclear testing and she said after studying us since the latter part of the 40s they that's why they know they spoke english with their mouths and they spoke english as good as i did in fact they've used words i've had to look up on the on the dictionary <laughs> there's been a couple instances where they use words that it's not even in my vocabulary you know and, and people say well you dreamed all that and i'm like hey, have you ever dreamed of a word that's not in your vocabulary that you had never heard and don't know the meaning of because <laughs> that's happened to me, a few times I've had to go look and see what, and it fit, it fit in the context of the conversation that they were talking about. So, and uh, but basically, they're on the what we're getting to is a little bit later. They want to know uh, if the if I thought the people of their our world and, and their world should meet, how we should go about it. Uh, they they want to know if the people of our world would be willing to donate biological material. And I said, yeah, I think we would. I think if, if you made open contact on a friendly basis, I think you would give, they'd give you just about anything you needed. And uh, and so, you know, the conversation, I, I, you know, I, I could feel the I could feel the weight of the conversation. It's like, man, I'm not just representing me. I'm representing every man, woman, plant, 
man, woman, and child on planet Earth, you know, I felt the weight of this conversation. Like, okay, man, you know, I probably shouldn't do a whole lot of talking and do more listening. And uh, I don't need to piss these guys off. And these are definitely the guys that I've been seeing. And in fact, the, the blue lady, uh, the, the picture that I took when I was hiding behind that oil field separator, that looks like her. She has a big ruby glued to her left cheek. And you can look at that picture. So there, there's not many experiences on, on the planet that I've seen that actually have are in communication with ET and have a picture of the ET that they're talking to. But you could look in that picture and you could see that it's a, I'm, I've drawn a sketch of what she looked like when I met it, met them in 2017. And, and in 2011, when I took that picture, uh, you could see that it's the same, uh, it's the same person. You know, she still got that big ruby glued to her cheek. And, uh, uh, she had a, like a diamond on her forehead and she had like a tattoo on her right cheek. A tattoo of some kind of look like corn or something. It almost didn't even look like a flower. It looked like it was maybe corn or something like that. And uh, she was tall, blue, athletic. And the other one, yeah, it was a cat. <laughs> you know, it's only, they never told me their names. They never, uh, but I remember Sam Freeman, what he said. I, I said, uh, can you guys show me how you got here? You know, I said, show me how you got here. And she goes, yeah, she goes, she, and the blue lady said, you'll be able to see my world. If you want to see my world, she said, you just walk to this wall right here. And she said, you'll be able to see where I can, where the people of my world come from. And I thought, okay. And and they were kind of frustrated. There's a there, there's a picture on my of the wall of my bedroom that has a glass. And I actually uh, made a video on my YouTube where, where it shows the picture and shows the wall I went through. And inside the – and. They were kind of frustrated that I was going so slow, man. They were going, you'll be all right. Just go. Just, you, you know, you can move through solid matter here. Just, but it's not like moving through smoke. You have to struggle through it. I mean, I could feel the, I could feel the glass in the picture going through my face. I could feel the sheet rock of the wall passing through my stomach. It, it didn't hurt, but it was very uncomfortable, odd feeling. Inside the wall, I hit a stud and it went through my right shoulder. And I really had to struggle through that damn stud because there's more mass to it. It's like you have a little bit of mass, but not a lot. And you have to struggle through matter. Uh, that's more that's, that's more solid. And so I had to like struggle through that stud in the wall to get through it. And then I didn't know, I think there might've been some misunderstanding. I didn't know if they wanted me to walk through the wall. Or I was just supposed to look through the wall. I think they intended for me to look through the wall. Uh, but instead I thought they wanted me to walk through the wall. So I took, one big step just to get out of that wall that was like irritating me. And uh, all of a sudden, man, I'm, I'm floating in zero gravity, outer space. And I'm, and I'm doing this slow forward head flip. And I look out there. It looks just like I'm not top of sky. So if there are star way more stars and there's even a, what looks like a black hole and there's in clear view of the sky. And it's just stars everywhere, man. There's hundreds of hundreds of thousands of stars just lighting up the place man and uh i look off to my left and there's a planet over there it's got three major continents it's got thin oceans it's got a frosty north south pole and i'm trying to take all this shit and i'm floating in outer space i don't need air to breathe i'm not cold i've never felt hot or cold you really can't you can't and i couldn't feel wet i mean it felt wet but i never got wet but i don't need air to breathe and i'm out here floating in outer space looking at this alien planet off to my left and I see what looks like a, their sun, but I, I, I finally, I think I realized it's probably a moon. It's probably a, a moon. And then there's another rocky moon goes floating between me and the planet. And I'm doing this slow forward head flip. So now my head's going down and I'm fixing to be, come back up the other way. And I'm thinking, wow, okay, well, I'm going to look to see where I came out. What the heck did I just walk out of? I'm going to get to see, was that a ship? What was that? You know, so as my head was coming back up, <laughs> it was the black crystalline blocks uh, box floating in outer space no lights, no technology on the damn thing it's just there in outer space just floating and that's what i walked out of it inside how it came to be how inside of that is my bedroom and outside of that is this place is it some kind of a stargate or something i have no idea and i don't know how i'm going to get back i don't know if i screwed up and i and uh and, and i floated around and i'm looking taking everything i could see in and uh and I mean, I see one large inland lake. There was a huge desert area. There was a place that was closer to the water that looked more like jungle. And I never saw not one cloud around this place, but there was a wispy, uh, like fog mist that was, uh, you could see over the whole place, except for the desert area. 
it was thicker over the jungle, but it wasn't anything over the desert area. And the desert area was massive. It was like, my gosh, man, it was, it was like a, a third of their planet is like desert. And the rest of it's like jungle. And she later told me that, that that's where a, a like a nuclear type explosion, they had been attacked in some interdimensional war that they had been involved in. And, and the, she even said that the, their adversaries, they, when they read our uh, text, they said the fallen angels. They said that they, they, these guys seem a lot like your fallen angels. And uh, they didn't know if we were in cahoots with them or whatever. But now the people of the world are demanding uh, to meet the people of our world. And, and, uh, and so anyway, I didn't know how I was going to get back. Well, one of them, they reached out, they grabbed me by the shoulder. And I'm I'm hanging on to their hand, trying not to get slung off because my feet is like whipping back and forth, and I'm afraid I'm gonna go flying off in outer space, you know, and be lost forever. So I'm trying to hang on to ever who grabbed me. And they pull me right back to the wall, and I'm back in my bedroom again. And I'm thinking, oh my God, okay, thank God it's, it was wonderful to see, but I'm glad I'm back. And uh, and the blue ladies asked me. She said, uh, you know, she said we've been tasked with collecting a biological sample. And uh, they said, you don't have to do it, but you'd really help be helping us out if you if you did. And I said, look, you know, I, I thought about it. And I, thought, Man. I said, I said, look, I'll be willing to do whatever it takes for the people of your world, the people of our world to meet. I said, count me in. You know, I, I'll be I'll be I'm, I'll be there to help whatever you need. I'll give you whatever you need as long as the people of our world can be friends, whatever. And I thought, man, what's this going to entail? And she said. And I said, well, how do you, how do you, how do you want to get this biological sample? You know? And she said, she said, this, uh, the, she pointed at the cat lady. She, she said, this is our, uh, this is our biologist, our, uh, our geneticist. She, I think she called her. She said, this is our, our geneticist. You know? And she said, uh, if you just be willing to have sex with her, she could get whatever she needed, you know? And, and I'm going, did she just, Say like sex. I mean, I just met these uh, ET. I'm still kind of in uh, ET shock here, and now it's, they want me to have sex with this cat lady. And even the blue lady said, "Look," she said, uh, "She said you have to understand on on the uh, on." She said, "You don't have to if you don't want to, but on on her world they have sex like the people of your world like smile at strangers and shake hands." She said, "Even the people of my world think it's odd." And she said she'd be willing to just, you know, willing to do that if you would be. And she could get everything she needed from that. And uh, I, I thought, well, it's, you know, it's very odd. She said, well, I'll step out and give you some privacy. And so the blue lady, she stepped out. She went, walked through the wall, the same wall that I'd went through. So I guess she went out there and hung out out, out in outer space, I guess. And uh, and the other one, she starts stripping down. And, uh, and then when she's. And, and and you have to realize both these old guys and they had uh, like like a like American clothes on. I mean, the cat lady she had like designer jeans on and a white blouse, and the other one had like some kind of like a gym suit on or something like that. And they told me at one point they said that this they said the, the people said that your world has already affected our world. They said uh, our the people of our world have have observed your world and and we fell in and we fell in love with some of your clothing. And we use products from our world to duplicate the clothing that we've seen on your world. And they said, uh, they said we had ritualistic wear, but we really didn't wear everyday clothing like, like the people of your world do. And they said, some of your clothing has become very popular on our planet. And she said, much to the frustration of the males who have to wait on the females to disrobe now before they can have sex. <laughs> so I was like, we're just screwing it up for them. We had... They haven't made open contact yet. We're already screwing their world up. <laughs> but uh, anyway, she said, these are some of the some of the items that we wore. I thought you'd feel more comfortable. They said, we, we decided to wear them uh, for this meeting. We thought you'd feel more comfortable. So but the cat lady disrobed, the blue lady hauls. And the cat lady, she has this, uh, she's, she has like a lion tail. She's got this, she's got this tan fur over, oh, she just, she's got, two legs two arms and and her body's covered with this felt like fur she's got these black stripes that look more like zebra stripes that go around her waist go around her legs all the way down and like uh, and i'm like wow that's you know she is amazing looking but certainly not human and uh and uh, then the cat lady says she said i've been observing you and your wife and she said i want you to make me feel like she is. 
<laughs> and she jumped up on the bed, uh, jumped up on the bed in the doggy zone position. I'm thinking, oh my God, all the, we think we got privacy, but we, we got no privacy, you know? And I'm going, oh my God, she's got this tail and it's whipping back and forth. And, and I'm going, what the hell have I got myself into here? And, uh, and my wife goes walking through the room. And my wife comes walking through the room and I'm going, oh shit, you know? So, and, uh, and they told me, they said, you know, said she can't hear a CS from here. This is the second time she walked through the room. She actually walked through the room earlier. The first time she walked through the room and kind of freaked them out because she, she walked through the room on the way to the bathroom. I could see the clothes she's wearing and everything. And I'm standing here with two ET women and she just, we're like 10 feet from her and she don't see us. And she said, they, they can't hear it. Said you got, they said, you can't see or hear, hear us. You know, that's just where we've been observing, you know, people of your world. You can't see or hear us, but we can hear and see everything. And my wife walks into the bathroom. She comes walking out and she paused and she looked over towards us and it freaked the cat lady out. And she asked the blue lady, she said, can't you see us? And she goes, no, no, she's looking at him. And, she, and, the, and the blue lady pointed at my body sleeping in the bed. And then my wife paused for a second and continued walking. I asked her later, I said, why did you do that? She said, because uh, you have some sleep apnea. I worry about your breathing. She said, so I'll, I'll pause. I'll see your chest going up and down. I know you're all right. Then I'll go ahead and leave. I didn't know she did it, but I got to see it from a third person view for the first time ever, you know. But we're having this conversation with these two. And uh, and, and the, even the, the cat lady, she comes walking out and she goes, she said, excuse me, ma'am. She says, can I have sex with your husband or something like that? Real loud. I mean, within about three feet from her. And uh, and she looked at me and she says, they can't hear or see us. And she said, it's, she said, it's, it's not like you're physically cheating on her. She said, your physical body is right there in the bed. And I looked and I realized, you know, she's got a point, I guess. So, you know, so I thought, let's just get this over with. <laughs> let's get it over with. So she, she, she got her sample and it was, it was a weird deal. She pulled out. She jumped upon the bed and she shot it in this, it's like a test tube and it had these lights. It was like a yellow plastic with some glass mixed and it. There was these white bluish lights that were running up and down the handle on it. Like, and you could see a light beam going back and forth in it. And, uh, and she was telling me that they, but because uh, they really have the, the raw material as opposed to the sample from this place, because they, this is, they have to do certain things to it. And I was like, if you're looking for ge genetic samples, I said, you're way better subjects than me. And uh, she goes, no, she said, we need, we need genetic samples from the masses of your people, not just from one or a few people. She said, we need like samples from everyone, you know? And, and that was, well, that was the whole point of them making open contact. And I'm saying, yeah, I think, you know, they'd be willing to donate that to you. And she said, yeah, she said, and, uh, and the blue lady came back in and she said, be sure to save enough for the clone project or something to that extent. I'm going, oh, crap, they're going to make a clone out of this. And uh, and, the, and she said, well, she said, they, they do so many genetic modifications on it. You know, they said, yeah, they, well, they'll mo modify it genetically and do all sorts of stuff. And and uh, I said, all right, OK, yeah, they, they're going to fix anything that's wrong with it anyway. So anyway. Uh, it was came time for me to it come time for me to leave, and uh, but the, the, the one thing she told me that she said to tell the people of my world, she said, Tell them when we first meet, uh, first rule of contact, I guess, is that they don't want uh, no physical contact without making a request and getting an af uh, uh, affirmation. They just want they don't want to, yeah, there's no physical contact unless it's agreed upon by both parties. And they want everybody to know that. And in uh, the and the cat lady, she said at some point that she said uh, she said we're very close to being able to solve most of our diseases. And, and she said uh, we use a double helix uh, genetic model. She said they use a triple helix genetic model. She said the people you're working very close. She said you might want to tell somebody who's in genetics to consider altering into a triple helix. So I don't know anything about that kind of stuff, but. She did tell me to mention that, so I wanted to make sure I, I say it every chance I get, so maybe somebody will pick up on it and understand what that means. Because I certainly don't know what it means, but I, it's worth worth repeating, I believe. So when it comes time to go back, okay, I'm standing there beside me. I said, well, how do I get back? She said, okay. She said, well, just lay on yourself, you know. So 
my body's in bed. I lay on top of my body there in bed and nothing's happening. I'm just laying on top of myself there in bed, not going back in. And, uh, and, and I said, well, it don't, it doesn't appear to be working. I'm thinking, my God, they're not very good at this, man. So anyway, she said, well, stand back up. So they, they had me stand back up. And then they told me, said, leap onto yourself. So I leaped on my body. This time I felt like I fell five feet, man. And when I hit, I woke up and uh, I woke up in bed and I looked and the room looked identical to the way it was before. The lights coming in around the windows were the same. The lights coming from the bathroom looked the same. I, my wife was wearing the same clothes I'd seen her wearing when she walked through the room twice. And I had the feeling the E2 ET was still standing there, but I just knew I couldn't see him anymore. So I waved goodbye to him. Right there, I was like, I'm back. I'm, I made it. All right. I have a feeling they were there. I just couldn't see them anymore. And uh, and so about two years went by, and I remember them taking the genetic sample, and I, and I ain't seen a whole lot. And I'm thinking, well, I guess I, I don't know if they're done with me. I'll never see anything like that again or what the deal was. And uh, it was February 2020. And uh, I know we just started getting rumors of COVID going around and uh wondering how bad it was going to get and uh so i was uh sleeping in my bed and uh next thing i know and i'm waking up it's like i woke up somewhere else i was laying in like a, a coffin with a glass cover on it and they pulled me out of it and, and man it felt like i was drunk or something man i could not i didn't it was like i was droggy and there's two like uh guys wearing these jack Lane looking suits helping me out like orderlies helping me up. I'm in an alien surgery room and there's like an alien doctor in there and he has PPE on, but you can tell by the size of his eyes that he's not human. And there's three nurses in there with him and you can tell by the size of their eyes that they're not human either. And so these guys are standing me up and I'm going, okay, I'm good, I'm good. And it's every time they let go of me, I try to fall. And at one point I fell into some kind of machine in, the, in this room and that alien doctor kind of lost his temper and he said, Y'all got to get him out of here. I said, he can't be in here until he stabilizes. And so these guys escort me out of this. Uh, so they they start walking me out of this thing, hold me by the shoulders. And I have to, I can see a haze in front of me. And it's it's like a mist or something like that. And I can see daylight on the other side of it. And when I walk through this thing, you can feel the pressure from the room rushing by my face. And they said, look, they said, uh, they said don't stand, uh, don't stand here. Uh, we're losing, losing, we're losing our surgical environment. You know, I said, move through this, uh, move through this air airfoil quickly. And, uh, so I had to walk through this airfoil and you could feel the, you could feel the air rushing by my face, running, rushing, blowing from the surgery room outward. And as I walked out of this thing, the next thing, you know, it's like, whatever this surgery room is, it's inside looks like a military mash tent, like some kind of, it's a green military mash tent with a plastic flat over the door. And I walk out of this daggum thing, and uh, there's like 200 houses. There's green fields. There's grass, rolling hills. <clears throat> it looks like Nebraska somewhere. And uh, and uh, there's these houses that are scattered everywhere, maybe 200 of them. And every house looks identical, like a military base or something like that. I don't know. It, it, I don't see any personal items, no clothes, no clotheslines, no cars. There's streets, but no cars. And uh, I have no idea where the hell this place is at, but they walked me out onto this. I, I'm basically looking. I don't even know where I'm, I don't know, know where the hell I'm at, really. And I walk out. And I notice my my arms or legs are glitching like they work fine for a second and then they'll hang up. At one point, my arm hung up and I couldn't move it. And I was trying to touch my face. And uh, all of a sudden it started working again. And I hit my face so hard that I, I almost felt a trickle of blood coming from my nose. Um, I mean, I was just glitching. I had these glitches that was causing me to fall. And and before, I was uh, I was not whatever this body it hurt when I hit the ground. This thing it hurt. I mean, it, 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 you you couldn't move through solid matter here. Solid matter hurt when you fell and hit. When I hit the floor, it hurt. When I hit the ground, it hurt. And these guys, they just had me sit down and and they I sit down on the curb on the street between these houses and stuff. And I looked. And I used to work in uh, road construction, so I know I know a little bit about building uh, highways and stuff. And and I was there there on the curb anyway, looking at the road. And I said, "Oh, here's a good chance that 
to look at this road. I looked at this road and it's, it's, it wasn't a road that humans made. It was like, uh, like we take, we take asphalt, spray it down and then spread rocks on top of it. But this, this road looked like a human road, but it wasn't, it, it was, it looked more like something they had mixed together, laid out like carpet. Uh, and, uh, I mean, a hell of a good road, but not made by us and not any kind of road I've ever seen made anywhere. And so these guys are, they kind of, I said, I think I'm all right. Now they stand me back up and uh, the cat lady comes out of this, she's out of the surgery room. And uh, I say this, this weird, I mean, these two orderly guys are standing there the whole time helping me, help pick me up when I fall down, trying to keep me from falling down. And then I say this, this uh, old rancher guy come walking up. Strange. I mean, this guy had a, he had Baja shorts. He had a Florida shirt like he was on vacation. He had an old straw hat on. You could tell that he spent most of his life outdoors like a rancher. Looked completely out of the situation. I don't know who this guy was. He comes walking over there, and the cat lady's coming out of the surgery room, and she talks to him. She says, she said, well, meet Ronnie, meet Ronnie Dawson. He said, I, he said, I'm familiar with Ronnie Dawson. And she looked at him again. She said, no. She said, I mean, the Ronnie Dawson from back there. And then the guy looked at me like, he goes, oh, you talking? She, he said, oh, this is, the, this is the real Ronnie Dawson. And she goes, yeah, yeah. He, he said, he looked at me, he said, are you in there? He said, oh, my goodness. He said, you're in there. He said, first trip, eh? <laughs> this guy's, he had a British accent. He's like, first trip, eh? And uh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, I, I guess, yeah, first trip, yeah. He go, and I said, "What the hell are you doing here?" I said, "Where the hell are we?" And he said, "Well, he said, he said, I don't know where the hell this is at." He said, "But uh, he said it ain't Earth." I said, "I was wondering that myself." He said, "He said, well, look at that sun. That'd be your first clue." I looked up at that sun. That sun is way bigger than our sun not near as bright as our sun. And you could actually stare at it for a couple of seconds without it actually hurting your eyes. I don't know where, I, you could tell it's not Earth's sun. And it's pretty easy to, it's, I mean, you could you could tell real quick that it's not our sun. But I mean, this place, the air smelled fresh. They had grass. I didn't see not one tree. It, rolling hills, houses, streets built between these houses. I didn't see any people other than that guy. He's the only person I've seen. Uh, that was uh, now th those two young guys. I mean, they didn't look like aliens at all. They were 100% human. Now, I don't know if they were human clones. Uh, and she told me that they'd be willing to help do anything I said, but I need to give very clear instructions to them before they'd fought, they could follow them correctly. And so I'm thinking they must have been clones of someone they had made. And uh, anyway, this guy, they, they stood me up. And uh, and I asked uh, his say he told me his name Jonathan Buitsi or something like that. He's from South Africa, and I asked him what what the hell are you doing here? And he said he's an alien contactee. So they're looking for alien contactees over the age of fifty who suffer from erectile dysfunction who are willing to have the uh, alien penile augmentation that I would had. He was he had agreed to it. He was going to be the second one to have it. And I said, oh, hold on there. He said, what the hell did you just say? Alien penile augmentation. And I looked at my body. The body and the, and the, the cat lady had told me, she said, you know, I said, uh, she said, we had to give you a little vaccination on the back of your left leg. And she said to protect our interest. And uh, I looked on the back of my left leg and there wasn't nothing there. And she goes, no, she said, uh, on back there, on your body back there. And I think I sent you a picture of the dots on the back of my leg after after this incident and I, I found the dots on the back of my leg and i made sure we took a picture of it so we'd have proof of it because you know people are all about the proof and uh and anyway so he said alien uh, so i'm looking down here i'm wearing these converse i had more converse lace-ups since like uh seventh grade basketball and they and and, the, and this body had tube socks that went almost all the way up to the knees. I haven't worn tube socks in like the seventies, and uh, it had these slinky shorts on that had like uh, almost like swimming trunk liners on the inside of them. And uh, it, but this when this guy said I'd had an alien penile augmentation, I, 
So I had I I pulled my shorts out. I run my hand off down there. But what was down there was not what's normally down there. I had a handful of like a giant noodle or something that they had put on this, and I and I started putting two to two. This is the clone body that they had made of me, and they put my consciousness in it, and uh, and it's got an alien penile clone on it. And the, and she told me, she said, she said, well, you said you'd be willing to help us. Do it, whatever it took for the people our world, people your world to get together. And she said, she said, we've got you here today. It said, uh, this is the clone that we made. We got an alien penal augmentation on it. And, and we're going to do a function test today. We have a young female volunteer in the surgery room waiting on us. And, uh, and they're ready to begin. And, uh, and I'm going, okay, well, this, this all got thrown at me quickly. So not only do I have an alien penis, I'm fixing to test the damn thing out. And uh, and I told, told him, yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't go back on my word, you know. I, I, I'm taking one for the team, I guess you could say. And I said, I, yeah, okay, yeah, if that's what you need. And uh, and uh, and she said, well, you might want to go ahead and take those shorts off. And she sprayed this stuff under my nose, and this thing stood up like a flagpole. And my God, it's not that big around, but it is long and skinny, 17 inches long. And uh, – and I'm sitting there looking at that thing, and even Jonathan's looking at it, going, "Oh hell," because he's fixing to get the same damn thing, I guess. And uh, so I take the shorts off and hand it to one of the, the guys, and then I don't know that she leads me off into the tent. There's a now there's a cat lady in there who's a, she's got white tannish skin, and she looks to be a lot younger than the other one, and she's got whiskers that are not trimmed, and they hang way down off of her you could tell that she's she's a lot younger than the other one and she's very athletic got black stripe she's got she's got white fur with black stripes all the way down and uh she gets up on the bed and, and she's putting she's putting these ankle restraints on herself and her feet are together and she's putting ankle restraints on and i'm going i don't know how the hell this is supposed to work well anyway the one of the the, the the nurses come over and she slides the bed apart. You can't even see it, but when they pull it, they pull her legs apart and and her. And then they they strap her her wrist down too, and they tell me it's for my protection or whatever. So, so basically, uh, they, they I'm in there and this this angry alien doctor is barking instructions at me. I'm having to have sex in a surgical setting with a doctor and three nurses, you know. Right there in the in the in the room with me, and I, and I'm trying to follow the doctor's orders, and this old gal's bucking in. And then they're trying, they're helping hold her down, and and uh, and the doctor tells me to, that whenever I feel the ejaculation, to leave it at full penetration or whatever, and uh, and so anyway, they so finally everything gets done, and and, I, and he goes, yes, yeah, so it's, it's going to be a little more intensive. Uh, a surgical procedure going on now. I said, you probably just want to leave. You probably want to exit. So you're welcome to stay, but you're probably rather exit. <laughs> and so uh, I basically left the t left the, the surgery room again and went back outside again where this Jonathan guy's at. And uh, and finally, this is the, the alien cat lady comes out there and she still got her PPE on and she's like, okay, she's got this. She's got this sack, and uh, and I think this sack is a reproductive organ of the gal that I just had sex with. I mean, they just they did a hysterectomy on her. Just I mean, quick. And uh, she comes back out. She's got this. She's got the reproductive organ in a sack, and she looks at me and she says, "Well, she says, well, the doctor wants you to, he wants you to slide the the organ over." Over over the penis and, and see that if there's an opening in the in the tube, he wants to make sure that the, the penis will reach the opening. And I'm going, oh my god, okay, I, I don't know how the hell this has worked. She just hands me the sack. She says, these two guys here will help you. Just tell them what you need. And I told them, well, let's take it out. Let's string it over the fence. Let's string it over this picket fence at one of the white houses. And I walked over there. She sprayed that stuff under my nose again. This thing went up like a flagpole again. And I basically threaded this gut over over the damn penis, and and uh, and I and I've, I've seen a hole in in the in the tube, and I'm going, okay, look right there. I uh, said, I think that's what he's talking about. And you can see the end of it right there. And she's going, okay. She said, all right. She said, well, she said, well, move it up 
up and down the penis and see if you can get it to ejaculate. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is so embarrassing. All these people are watching. And, oh, Lord. And uh, so I start moving the thing up and down on it. And I, I'm going, I don't feel anything. I don't, it's, you know, it's not working. And I feel stupid anyway. So I'm like, I don't think it's going to work. So I, and she said, okay, we just put it back in the set. So we took it. We put it back in the sack. And then all of a sudden, this alien penile just starts dripping stuff out. I guess the semen just starts dripping out of it. It's like a, it's, you can't feel the orgasm on this thing. It's just like it's a side effect of rubbing on it, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, the orgasm starts dripping out of this thing. And she says, I'll just, she said, catch it in the sack if you don't mind. So they held the sack over there and catching the drippings off this damn thing. Oh my God, man. And, uh, and anyway, she goes, well, you know, so we really appreciate you, you helping us, helping us out here, you know, and said, uh, I said, yeah, yeah. She said, and she said, we're going to, she said, we'll send you back. And she said, she had, she told me to have a seat there on the curb. And she put some kind of little, I think it was like, a, I don't know, it looked like a headphone almost thing on my head. And she put this little headphone thing on my head. And I said, well, I can go back in there if I need to and lay back down. And she goes, no. She said, these guys here, they, they can carry you in there easily. And they said, they'll just carry They'll they'll carry the body back in there after after you've gone. So she put it on my head, and I guess maybe I passed out. I woke back up at home, and uh, after all that went on, I, I felt really refreshed, like I had slept really well. <laughs> and I woke up that morning, remembered everything, and was like incredibly like I slept a really good sleep. I guess when your consciousness ain't in your body, you sleep really peacefully. I guess I don't know, but they put me back, and I woke up back at home. And I forgot the marks on my leg that she had told me about. I didn't even think about it. And I was in the bathroom with my wife. I've been itching it all day long. And I, and my wife said, do you got some weird marks on the back of your left knee? And I thought, shit, that's what she told me they did. They told me they would do that. You know, and I had those marks. I said, we got to get a picture of that. People are going to want to see that. So uh, we got a picture of that. And uh, so that people could see it because that was part of the story. And uh, since then, I haven't seen these guys since. You know, I don't know when the next, you know, the only time I've seen them was like, I had this other guy. I don't know. I don't know what this was. I think this, I think I got a visit by an angry Anunnaki guy, man. I mean, this guy was a giant. This sucker was 12 feet tall. It looked like just, it looked just like some of the Anunnaki statues over there in Egypt, man. And uh this guy came into my head while I was sleeping and threatened, basically threatened me, told me to shut up. No one's going to believe my story. And I, and he said he looked into my future to see how much damage I'd caused him by opening my mouth and that I'd be better off just sh shut my mouth and not telling the story any longer. And, uh, and he goes, he said, I looked in your future to see how much damage you, you're going to cause this. And he said, it, it was a short trip. He said, you'll be, he said, you'll be sick in three years. And you'll be dead in five. He said, and I said, so 65, you'll be dead. I'm 63 right now. And and he said, you, I would have health issues at 63, and I am having health issues. And I'm going, oh, crap. <laughs> so much for that long retirement. <laughs> if this guy is telling the truth, I'll be dead in a couple of years anyway. You know, So I'm hoping he's wrong. But it was the next night that alien doctor showed up in my dream, and he said, look, he said, don't pay no attention to that guy. He said, you're going to have a... a some kind of a, uh, what the hell did he? I don't watch a lot of medical shows, but he was like, he said, I'm gonna have a, uh, oh, why I can't remember what it's, it's like a blood clot in my right lung that's gonna travel to my heart or some kind of shit like that. And he said, they could stop it. And he said, we can put, we could put this device over to prevent it. And, and I said, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> you know, and he goes, ah, don't worry about it. He said, don't worry about those guys. So, and he said, yeah, the alien doctor told me, don't worry about those guys. He said, we can put this. And he showed me like a little square device they put over the bottom of my right lung to prevent this blood clot that would kill me at the age 65. So I guess we'll see if they get that thing put on or not. But that's the last contact I've had with them. And that happened like in 21, November of 2021. Well, I'm uh, 62, so I'm right behind you. You're how old are you? 
62 going out 63. Okay, so you're you're just yeah. tiny bit ahead of me. You're I turned 62 in April, so now, having some kidney stone issues <laughs> right now, <laughs> and I got some other abdominal stuff going on that they're looking at. <laughs> So, so are, I'm are you hoping, hoping, they're, hoping they're wrong. Are they said planning? I'd be sick at they said I'd be sick at 63 and dead at 65. And uh, 63 is be November. November is when I'll be 63. And I'm already having some issues that we're looking at. <laughs> are you planning your retirement yet? Ah, probably when I'm 65. So if I can make it that long, <laughs> if my body holds out that long. Well, <laughs> I think if you're my age then you have to wait till you're 67. Well, no, you don't have to wait at all. But if you want to get the full retirement, you, can, you have to wait Right, to right. If that guy's right, it won't matter. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I hope a guy's wrong. But, uh, but I mean, this guy, yeah, it was a giant. I mean, this guy, he, I mean, he had me in a basket hole. And I mean, my, I was trying to kick, kick him into growing as he had me in a basket hole. That's how big this guy was. He could have dismembered me. I mean, he could have just literally tore me apart. And he held me in a basket hole the whole time he was talking to me. And then I told him, I said, yeah. I said, I said no. I said, uh, I said, you're, I said humanity's not going to be your slaves anymore. And that every, people got a right to know. And the fact that I've caused you enough problem that you've had to come here to confront me makes everything I've done so far worthwhile. And it pissed the guy off, and he threw me across the damn floor and stomped off. And then it was the next night. It was, it was the next night that the alien doctor showed up and said, "Don't worry about that guy." So, so those two events were you in your dreams or not? Yeah, I think that was a dream, or I don't know if it was out of body. No, I wasn't out of body, man. It was like they got in my head. It was like they came into my head this time, you know. And it was like that's. You know, that's a really weird dream. And uh, then the alien doctor showed up, you know, the next night. And it was like he paid me a visit and said, don't worry about that guy. We'll take care of you. <laughs> I guess I guess we'll see if they do. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure having you on my show. Um, right. It, you. It, it's kind of hard to fit all that into two hours. It's a lot <laughs> of information. Oh yeah, there's detail. My story has details to details. You know? <laughs> there are details to the details. So uh, what's the name? What's the name of the town you're in again? Ranger, Texas. Ranger. I'll have to look it up one of these days. So yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, is there anything else you want to say to the uh, audience before you go? No, I just uh, if you could, there's a uh, if I catch pictures and stuff like that, like I said, you can see them on Google Images, Ronnie Dawson UFO pictures, and uh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, that man escapes alien abduction with pictures to prove it video that the anomaly is on has nine hundred six thousand views, and uh, I think my channel has like one million two hundred something thousand views, so there's a lot of traffic there. I got the bar, I got the book on Barnes and Noble, Amazon, the Ronnie Dawson UFO story. I was a featured speaker at the Laughlin UFO MegaCon, and hopefully to get a few more speaking events at some point at a UFO well, conference near you. It sounds like you're uh, you're on your way to uh, stardom. So <laughs> I got two I got two years. <laughs> well, that guy, I got I, two I, years. I, I wouldn't so worry I better, about it I better too hit much. it quick. <laughs> I, I wouldn't worry about it too much. The other side, they say, is better than this side. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I wouldn't worry about dying because you know if you <laughs> listen to all the sh listen to all the uh, near death experiencers talk you know it's over there is much better than over here. So yeah, I'm wondering about the clone. You know, if you have a clone and if I die in this body, does my consciousness automatically go to the clone since I have a clone? Who well, knows? the, the um, one of my relatives claims to have been cloned by aliens, so I uh, uh. won't reveal who that is but uh yeah i've you're not the only one that claims they've been cloned so anyway thank you very much for being on my show let me uh go ahead and stop the recording here okay thank you charles